Valley. Welcome and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the 2022 NAC Spring Meeting. All lines are in a listen-only mode until the public comment period. If you would like to offer a public comment, please press star 1 on your phone, unmute, provide your name and affiliation. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. It's my pleasure to turn the call over to Karen Battle. You may now begin, ma'am. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the 2022 National Advisory Committee Spring Virtual Meeting. Uh, yesterday, we had a very productive day filled with engaging dialogue, and I expect that to continue today as well. Uh, at 1.40 p.m. today, the public will have an opportunity to comment. Uh, we reserve this time to allow the Census Bureau, members of the NAC, and others who are attending this virtual meeting to hear the thoughts and concerns of the public. During that time, I will pause the meeting and invite the public to submit verbal comments by selecting star one on your phone, providing your name and affiliation, and proceeding with the public comment. Please note that verbal public comments are limited to two minutes. If you are unable to offer verbal public comments, or if your comments are longer than two minutes, please send your comments in written form. The Federal Register Notice located on the NAC website provides more information on submitting written comments. You will also find information regarding closed captioning services on the website. To help facilitate the discussion, the Census Bureau will keep the phone lines for NAC members live. I kindly ask NAC members to keep your lines muted until acknowledged by the chair or the vice chair so that we can keep background noise to a minimum. Similar to yesterday, video capability is available for Census Bureau presenters and committee members. As a reminder to my Census Bureau colleagues, I encourage you to enable video during your presentation and the question and answer session. Once your topic has ended, you may turn off your video. Today, first on the agenda, our committee vice chair, Cherokee Bradley, will provide opening remarks. Following Cherokee Bradley's remarks, Nicholas Jones, Roberto Ramirez, and Meredith Rios Vargas will present the Census Bureau's plans to explore 2020 census results to improve future questions and statistics on race and ethnicity. This will be followed by a presentation from NAC discussants, Helen Samhan and Karthik Ramakrishnan, who will share preliminary thoughts on this topic before the committee discussion begins. After that, we will hear from Ben Bolander and Eric Jensen, who will present the blended base for population estimates, followed by discussant Andrea Centino, and then we will have committee discussion. At that point, after that has concluded, we will pause for a 10-minute break. Following the break, Tom Ule will present on the quality of administrative records data used in the 2020 census, followed by discussion to enter deep chat wrap and committee discussion. And at exactly 1.40 p.m. today, we will pause the meeting for the public comment period. Following the public comment session, we will hear from Keith Finley, who will present on criminal justice administrative records, followed by discussant John Sandoval and committee discussion. And then we will have an, another 10-minute break. Uh, during that time, we will suspend the public meeting proceedings until 4.15. And please note that the WebEx platform and conference bridge will remain open during this time but committee deliberations will be conducted in a private offline session. At 4.15, we will reconvene for the presentation of the NAC 2022 Spring Virtual Meeting Recommendations until we adjourn at 5 p.m. I would like to remind committee members that once called on by the chair, please clearly state your name for the record. This is needed each time you speak for the most accurate transcript. And as a reminder to the public, during each question and answer session occurring today, only committee members are permitted to ask questions or make comments. So now at this time, uh, please welcome NAC Vice Chair, Cherokee Bradley, who will offer opening remarks. Good morning. 
I too would like to welcome everyone to day two of the next spring virtual meeting. I'd like to issue a thank you to Director Santos and all of the Census Bureau staff for all the work that you put into making this meeting happen. Excuse me. Also would like to thank James Tucker for your leadership as chair of the NAC. And I have to ask of all NAC members, I will keep my, my opening remarks very short. We have a very compressed agenda today with a lot of recommendations and we continue to encourage your discussion. We ask that you keep discussion items and questions as succinct as possible so that we may be able to get through the agenda in a timely manner. Again, thank you for, for, for participating again in the, the, excuse me, day two of the next spring meeting and I will turn it over to Karen so that we may be, may be able to start our first discussion. Thank you very much, Cherokee. So now let's welcome Nicholas Jones, Roberto Ramirez, and Meredith Rios Vargas, who will present on the plan to explore 2020 census results to improve future questions and statistics on race and ethnicity, followed by discussants Helen Sanhan and Karthik Ramakrishnan, who will offer remarks before the committee. Good morning. Thank you, Karen. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Meredith, Roberto, and I are very pleased to talk with members of the National Advisory Committee today about the important work we're continuing at the Census Bureau to improve statistics on race and ethnicity for our country. We thank you for your ongoing support and for your encouragement for this work to advance discussions about the need for better data on race and ethnicity. Can you hear me well? Yes. Perfect. Our work at the Census Bureau continues in our efforts to ensure the statistics we produce meet the needs of data users, policies, and programs, as well as informing our collective understanding of our country's complex racial and ethnic identities and the resulting knowledge about our demographic composition and increasing diversity. Today, we are going to discuss what 2020 census results Tell us about the persisting problem with the two separate questions approach for race and ethnicity statistics. We will also present our plan for exploring the 2020 census results to help inform our work to improve data on race and ethnicity, frame on re-examining four key topics that we explored last decade. And our commitment to this endeavor has not wavered. We are building upon the solid foundation of expansive research and outreach that has been strengthening over the past decade and a half through our work with you, the previous NAC advisors, partners, and organizational leaders in the public. We are motivated by the 2020 census results to improve data for our country. Next slide, please. So way back in 2007, the year many of us got our first iPhones, if you can remember, the Census Bureau started exploring new ways to improve how the questions we ask could better align with the ways in which people identify their race and or ethnicity. Over the past 15 years, our extensive research and outreach identified that a combined race and ethnicity question was the optimal design for improving data to better measure our nation's racial and ethnic diversity and composition. However, the Census Bureau does not make a unilateral decision on the content of the decennial census. Determining content involves empirical research, outreach and engagement, and ultimately the review and approval from the U.S. Office of Management and Budget, or OMB, and the United States Congress. In accordance with OMB's 1997 race ethnicity standards, the 2020 census used two separate question designs for collecting data on race and ethnicity. Next slide, please. We've made several positive improvements for the 2020 questions within the framework of the 1997 OMB standards by providing dedicated write-in areas and examples for each major race category. And we substantially enhance our race, our race and ethnicity code lists that reflect a myriad of responses people report. These improvements allow people to more accurately report their detailed racial and ethnic identities and sharpen our collection coding and tabulation for disaggregated racial and ethnic groups. And this was critical because people reported more detailed identities than ever before. In 2010, for example, we processed about 55 million write-in responses. And this rose to 350 million in 2020. However, 
Even with these improvements, the 2020 census results show a fundamental problem with the two separate question designs. The problem, uh, the trouble responses have with the separate question design persists. In fact, these issues have gotten worse and we'll see them more clearly in 2020. Next slide, please. Thank you. Using the separate question format in 2020 resulted in reporting patterns that are even more pronounced than when we saw in the research of last decade. But we are not surprised by the results or research predicted them. In 2020, the sum of their race alone or in combination group increased 129% to 50 million people, surpassing the black or African American population as the second largest race alone or in combination group. Of the 62 million Hispanics in 2020, about 45 million were classified as some other race, either alone or in combination, compared with only 4.6 million people who were not Hispanic of Hispanic origin. About 34 million people identified with multiple race groups in 2020, up from 9 million in 2010. And the largest combination reported was white and some other race at 19 million. But the some other race category on the decennial census is not the problem. Instead, the some other race category spotlights the problem with the two separate question format. The intent of the some other race category is to be a residual category for people who do not identify with any of the minimum OMB groups. But when the residual category is the second largest response group, changes need to be made. And we have identified a solution with the combined question. Next slide, sorry. We are confident that differences in overall racial distribution seen in the 2020 census are largely, largely due to improvements in the design of the two separate questions for the race collection and processing, as well as some demographic changes over the past 10 years. And we want to stress that we are also confident, as shown in our research over the past decade, that using a single combined question for race and ethnicity in the decennial census would ultimately yield an even more accurate portrait of how the U.S. population self-identifies, especially people who self-identify as multiracial or multi-ethnic. Next slide, please. So as social scientists, we recognize that race and ethnicity are fluid social constructs that change over time as they're influenced by social, political, economic factors. So where are we now? Well, 2022 brought the Census Bureau a new director, Robert Santos. Welcome aboard. Director Santos has been very supportive and encouraging of our research and outreach on race and ethnicity. In 2020, our census team is continuing to work on 2020 census data products, including producing the demographic and housing characteristic file, as you heard yesterday, in a detailed uh, DHC, which will provide population counts and characteristics for disaggregated race and ethnicity groups. And of course, in 2020, we have a continue to engage with external partners about these topics and to gain feedback directly from you as our advisors on the National Advisory Committee for Race, Ethnic, and Other Populations. For the second half of our session, we will present how we are exploring 2020 census data on race and ethnicity to re-examine four key topics that we explored last decade. Next slide, please. The first topic examines whether the separate race and ethnicity questions used in the 2020 census continue to yield high item non-response rates. Over the decades, we have seen increasing non-response rates on the race question, especially by Hispanic or Latino respondents, and also increasing non-response to the Hispanic question by non-Hispanic respondents. We will examine the 2020 census results to see how and to see what the results show. Next slide, please. These are the research questions that we're planning to explore to examine the quality of the separate question format for the Hispanic origin and race questions respectively. Question number one, are the item non response rates for the Hispanic origin and race questions in the 2020 census similar to the 2010 census? Are people of Hispanic origin 
compared to non-Hispanics still more likely not to answer the race question? Is the non-response rate to the race question among Hispanics similar to historical reporting patterns observed in prior censuses and census tests, such as the 2015 National Content Test? And are the item of response rates for the Hispanic origin of race questions in the 2020 American, 20, excuse me, in the 2021 American Community Survey similar to the 2020 census? And finally, how can the Census Bureau improve item on response rates in the decennial census and an American Community Survey, particularly among Hispanic population? And this is going in and examining the separate question format versus the combined. Next slide, please. Our second topic examines whether the race reporting patterns of Hispanic or Latino respondents in 2020 census are still showing us that Hispanic or Latinos are not able to choose a major OMB race category in response to the race question. One of the most notable findings from our research in the 2015 National Content Test was that while the separate questions produced some of the race reporting for Hispanics as high as 39%, combined questions designed yielded a substantially reduced some of the race population at about half a percent. And pulling this separate question format in 2020 resulted in reporting patterns that are even more pronounced than the results in our 2015 national content test research. In 2020, the Hispanic population primarily reported their race as some other race or reported multiple races, one of which was SOR. The number of Hispanics reporting some of the race alone had a percent change of 41.7%, from 18.5 million in 2010 to 26.2 million in 2020. The number of Hispanics reporting multiple race groups increased from 3 million 6% to 20.3 million or 32.7%, with a change of 567%. And the number of Hispanics who identified as white alone decreased by 52.9%, down from 26.7 million to 12.6 million over the 10-year period. Next slide, please. Thank you. This report will build upon the working paper number 102, which is called Race Reporting Among Hispanics 2010, and it will examine race reporting among self-reported Hispanics in the 2020 census, develop supplemental data to the findings already presented in the 2020 census and the 2015 National Content Test Race and Ethnicity Analysis Report. It will also provide more in-depth analysis to improve our understanding of how Hispanics reported their racial identity within the improved separate question design and updated data processing and coding procedures for the 2020 census. I want to note that when we say self-reported Hispanics, this includes people who self-reported to be Hispanic or Latino origin. This category does not include responses that were assigned or allocated or substituted during the data processing. This research will examine the following four key areas an overall demographic description of the Latino population in the 2020 census by item non-response and imputation type. We will look into race reporting among Hispanics by the U.S. Office of Management and Budget race groups, or the OMB race groups. We will do a comparison of race reporting patterns among self-reported Hispanics for 2010 and 2020, and different response types to the race question by selected demographic characteristics now. and geography. Next slide, please. The research questions are the following. How do self-reported Hispanics report their race using the improved 2020 census race question, and how does this compare to the 2020, 2010 race reporting? How does the response to the race question by self-reported Hispanics differ based on their demographic characteristics? For example, detailed Hispanic origin, sex, age, household type, and tenure. For example, in 2010, we saw 
that those who were 65 years and older were more likely to respond to the race question and report an OMB race category than the younger population. Conversely, people between ages 18 and 44 were more likely to report an SOR race category than those outside of this age group and most likely to leave the race question blank with a total of 13.4%. How does the response to the race question by self-reported Hispanics differ based on the geographic location? With this question, for example, in 2010, Hispanics residing in the South were more likely to report an OMB race category only and less likely to report an SOR category and more likely to respond to the race question than Hispanics that were residing on other regions. Next slide. The third topic for our research examines the size of detailed race and ethnicity groups within each of the major categories. This will work will help us to confirm whether the percentages of the six largest detailed groups in each category continue to comprise the vast majority of their respective populations. This is a really key dimension of our design work in the 2015 NCT when we put the questionnaire formats together with the use of multiple detailed checkboxes, examples for the major categories, and writing areas for each category. Building on the knowledge that the six largest groups for each category comprise upwards of 90% of the total population for their aggregate category. Next slide, please. Beginning in 2020, the U.S. Census Bureau implemented changes to the Hispanic origin and race questions to our data processing and our coding based on the extensive research and outreach we conducted over the past decade. These incredible improvements allowed us to elicit and collect more detailed race data than any previous census, as you heard from Roberto. The primary goal of this new research is to evaluate the reasonableness of detailed race data that was collected in the 2020 census and the recent ACS one-year data and understanding the distributions and changes within these groups between 2010 and 2020. Additionally, this research will lead to recommendations on which detailed groups to list as example groups and as checkboxes in future data collection. Some of the most significant improvements included adding dedicated write and response areas and examples the white racial category and the black or African-American racial category, allowing for more of white and black detailed race group reporting than ever before. We also provided six example groups for each of the white, black or African-American, and American Indian or Alaska Native racial categories. Again, these examples represent the largest population groups within each of the geographically diverse population definitions for the categories as defined by the 1997 OMB standards. We reordered detailed Asian and detailed Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander checkboxes by population size, and we changed the checkbox category Guamanian or Chamorro to Chamorro based on research and positive stakeholder feedback. We also increased the number of characters captured in the write-in areas from 30 characters in 2010 to 200 characters in 2020, which allowed us to capture and fully recognize longer and more detailed write-in responses. And Significantly, instead of prioritizing multiple responses into only two codes within these writing areas, we coded what we saw, putting up to six detailed response categories for each and every writing area. Next slide, please. So in our research, we're planning to explore for this third topic, several research questions as shown here on the slide, to examine detailed race group reporting patterns from the 2020 census, recent ACS data, compared to previous census data in 2010. Because of the non-response bias in the 2020 ACS and the impact it may have on detailed race groups, we'll be using the 2021 ACS one-year data rather than the 2020 file. First, we'll examine and analyze whether the detailed race group distributions in each major category are reasonable when compared to 2020 census and ACS data, when comparing back uh, to the ACS files and the 2020 census data. Second, we'll review detailed race groups in each major category to see which of these detailed groups experienced the largest growth or change and the largest decline by percent change when comparing 2020 to 2010. For our third question, based on 2020 census data and the 2020 ACS one-year production data, we'll be looking at which of the largest detailed groups for each major race alone category and for each major race alone or in combination category compared to the 2010 census. 
We're all also looking at differences in the detailed race groups for each major race category for the race alone populations compared to the race alone or combination populations. And based on the largest detailed race groups for each of the race alone populations and the alone or in any combination populations, we'll determine which groups should be included as examples and detailed checkboxes in future race data collections. We'll also be looking at the Middle Eastern and North African or MENA responses collected in a distinct category in data collections to see which of the detailed groups should be listed as examples and detailed checkboxes for categories used in the future. Next slide, please. We have conducted a wealth of research and outreach which demonstrated that a dedicated MENA response category in a combined question format works well and is supported by the MENA communities. Our fourth topic examines the reporting of Middle Eastern and North African groups in the 2020 census race question. Next slide, please. We plan to examine where detailed MENA responses in the Census Bureau's MENA classification were provided in terms of dedicated write-in areas, which responses were reported, as you can see here on the slide, how often these responses were reported in conjunction with uh, marking in the major checkboxes, such as white or black or Asian or some other race, for example. We also know that we have received feedback from key stakeholders that additional groups, such as Somali, Sudanese, Armenian, and others should be included in the MENA classification. We plan to examine where these dedicated groups were reported in the race question. And we will be evaluating what the largest detailed MENA responses are so we can offer recommendations for example groups and detailed checkboxes for future data collection. Next slide, please. We know it's critical that our statistics represent how people identify their complex racial and ethnic identities in the 21st century. We're committed to addressing ways to produce more accurate and more reliable race ethnicity data. To do so, we'll build on our extensive research and outreach over the years and our insights from the 2020 census results that we described today. We'll collaborate with our colleagues at OMB and around the federal statistical community, and we'll continue to engage with advisors like all of you. Improving how the census collects race ethnicity information will enable the ACS and other federal surveys to provide more accurate and more reliable race ethnicity data for federal, state, and tribal programs, for civil rights policies, for ensuring fair and equitable compliance with anti-discrimination laws and regulations, and for external partners like local governments, community organizations, and academic researchers. We deeply value your partnership as our advisors and your commitment to these ongoing efforts. And we look forward to future discussions with you as this important work continues. Finally, on the last slide, we have three questions that we posed to help guide today's discussion with NAC members. The first question is, do you have any questions about the 2020 census results that show the persisting problems with separate questions on race and ethnicity? Second, do you have additional recommendations for our research explorations that we shared today that would help inform this research? Third, are there suggestions from NAC members on the groups that the Census Bureau could engage with as we develop and share this research with the public? We thank you and we look forward to your feedback. And with that, I'll turn it back to Karen Battle. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas, Roberto, and Meiragi. Uh, I believe we are now ready to hear from our discussants, starting with Helen Sandman. Thank you very much and thanks to the Population Division for all of its support over the years in um, trying to improve data collection, not only on the community I work with, which is the Arab American community, but also on the broader um, MENA region. Um, I may be new to the NAC, this is my first year, but I'm not new to the Census Bureau. I've been working for um, over 30 years in my um, capacity as a staff member of the Arab American Institute to better imp to improve collection um, uh, data and presentation of data on the Arab American community. First slide, please. It's important to first recognize the work that the population division has been doing over, over, for over a decade, um, more than a decade, on helping to improve data collection on this population. 
Um, one of the first iterations was a report on Arab ancestry, which the Census Bureau uh, re uh, uh, published in the early 2000s. And at the same time, um, the Arab American Institute was the first uh, designated census information center for uh, the population st statistics on the Arab community. Um, perhaps one of the biggest initiatives that the population division did was a national uh, convening a national forum with advocates and scholars from uh, that represent populations from the MENA region in 2015 and it was in conjunction with its first national content test on, on um, a MENA category. The, the Census Bureau has been very consistent in its outreach to stakeholders and partnerships and, um, and I applaud them for that because that really has expanded the um, information about the census to our communities um, and it has uh, created a two-way street which I think is very, very important. I also mentioned that the content test in 2015 of AMENA category was probably the first thing that really got the ball rolling on this question of AMENA uh, reporting category. And I'd also like to thank Director Santos for his public support for um, AMENA category. That has meant a lot to us. Next slide. Why do we need data on the population from the Middle East and North Africa? Uh, I think the most obvious one is that because of the current standards, the population from the MENA region is basically invisible within the broader white population statistics. And the fact that there is no disaggregated data on the MENA community basically masks a lot of differences that these um, communities, which are more recent immigrant communities um, than the, uh, the majority white population from Europe, um, th there are many differences that uh, we cannot study or, uh, or uh, research because of the way they are presented in the OMB standards. We have known for decades that there is great need for data for health research to provide language services, immigrant services, to help with hate crime and discrimination reporting. And in a very few instances where there is a large concentration, for example, of Arabic speaking voters, we know that the Voting Rights um, Act would uh, support the translation of certain ballot uh, translations if we had better data on those language communities. We, we have been a beneficiary of the ancestry data that is provided by the ACS, but there are limits to that data. The fact that it is collected only on a sample survey, the methodology of the data, the, the fact that there's no imputation for missing the data, et cetera. Um, so we, we believe very strongly that it should be a minimum reporting category. Um, and finally, I want to note that of all the refugee populations that have come into the United States since 2016, three of the top five um, are from the region, Syria, Iraq, and Somalia. Next slide, please. Um, while we might, uh, we agree for the most part, uh, our stakeholders for the most part with the Census Bureau on what is considered part of the MENA region, but we believe that it is a little bit of a larger and more inclusive um, category. It really um, includes three basic uh, subcategories. One would be the member states of the League of Arab States, which are the 22 countries in the Middle East and North Africa where Arabic is the official language. There are non-Arab MENA countries, Iran, Israel, and Turkey. And then very importantly, there are transnational communities that reside throughout the region um, who have specific sub-ethnic identities and, um, and therefore, but, but are part of this regional um, community and therefore should, should also be included, such as Assyrians, Chaldeans, Kurds, and the Amazigh. Next slide. We are really grateful that um, there has been quite a bit of public support over the last decade for um, a MENA uh, a, a ca reporting category. When the, when the Federal Register opened for public comments, both in, 19, in 2015 as well as in 2017, the overwhelming majority 
of the responses were in favor of testing and then implementing a MENA category. We're appreciative of the NAC for its support of the MENA reporting category over the years. And then just recently in March, a letter was sent to the OMB that was signed by uh, 160 national and community-based organizations in requesting and supporting the inclusion of a MENA reporting category. Next slide, please. We're also very encouraged by the fact that um, there is some support in government circles for the MENA category. Um, the ex recent executive order that was um, issued by the Biden administration on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities included uh, MENA populations as uh, groups that should have um, better uh, data collection. We also were very pleased that last month in, in conjunction with Arab American Heritage Month that the USAID director um, uh, report, uh, announced that USAID will be the first federal agency to include a MENA category on a combined question on race and ethnicity um, in its workforce diversity survey. Um, and we're very, very pleased that Samantha Powers made that um, announcement and that we hope that more federal agencies will follow. And we know that there are some various state and local entities specifically in Michigan and California that already did to aggregate the data. Next slide. Um, one of the things that we support is that, um, and while there is, there is general consensus, is for the MENA um, uh, reporting category to be presented as an ethnic category that allows for different racial identifications. Um, and to some extent, the, the MENA category has already been racialized, but we think that that, is, um, a, a, that does a disservice to the broadest and most inclusive data collection. And we think that there is consensus among the stakeholders that it should be presented not as a racial category, but as an ethnic category, because there are varying degrees of racial identities with, from that region. There are people who still identify in the white race category, but, but would, but would uh, support a, a MENA category for their ethnic identity. There are um, people from the MENA region who, are, who identify as black, and there are people from the MENA region who still identify as some other race. Um, we also are pleased to report that there is consensus in our um, population groups that um, a combined question with a MENA reporting category is, um, is what we support. Next slide, please. Some of my feedback to the presentation, and I really thank the Population Division for their work on this topic. Um, and one is, um, I imagine that there are challenges comparing responses from the 2020 census where there were subgroup um, responses allowed in 2010 when there were none, and then in the 2015 content, uh, national content test, which actually tested a MENA category. So um, I, I, I would like to know if you are concerned about that apples, oranges, and pears situation. Um, also, we, we wonder about whether there might be example bias um, in if a, if a particular um, country of origin from the MENA region is listed in the, uh, in the black race or in the white race, does that encourage people from those communities to, um, to uh, self-identify by that race? We're also curious about the respondents from the MENA population groups to the some other race question before they were, they were reassigned. And did you notice any increase in between 2010 and 2020 in the some other race respondents from the MENA region. And then finally, do you anticipate any resistance from the OMB um, to a combined question or to a MENA reporting category? Um, next slide, please. Um, finally, my recommendations um, on behalf of the coalition that I work with would be that 
the Census Bureau hire a subject matter expert not only on the MENA population but also on the SOGI population as, as part of the outreach that you will be doing with the OMB. We strongly support the use of um, examples that based on the broad uh, geography and subgroup distinctions of the MENA region, not just the largest, but sometimes there are, um, there are so many sub-regional divisions within the Middle East and North Africa that we think it's important to cover those groups. Um, we do, um, to answer your question, we think that um, examples should be included both in our MENA reporting category as well as in the race categories for white and black. And lastly, because we anticipate a lot of confusion about the survey, since this would be the first time that a MENA category would be included, we do encourage strongly to have more focus groups about the, the, the uh, abilities that respondents have to, to respond to both race and MENA origin. And with that, I'll turn it over to Karthik. Thank you so much. Uh, I just have a few slides uh, and uh, really uh, eager to uh, hear the comments from the rest of the members. Uh, and this is just to provide a bit more of, a, uh, of an overview uh, from what we just uh, heard um, from uh, Census Bureau staff. Next slide, please. So first, uh, the Census Bureau is to be applauded for its extensive research and development process, which has been laid out uh, already. Uh, and this involved not only research, but also outreach to uh, a variety of um, stakeholders and experts, as well as testing by the Census Bureau. Uh, there was a robust engagement process led by many um, stakeholders from the research community, from uh, civil rights organizations, uh, and uh, many other entities. Uh, and there was also an extensive public comment uh, period by the Federal Register in 2016 that all pointed in the kinds of recommendations we have heard today. Unfortunately, uh, this was not implemented uh, during the 2020 census, and as we have heard, many of the problems that were anticipated uh, persist through the 2020 census. Uh, there is now a renewed push to expedite and complete the unfinished business of revising these standards. This is a uh, stakeholder letter where we, uh, where we have dozens of um, civil rights, uh, community organizations, civic organizations, academic entities, philanthropic business, and other public and private sector groups that, uh, that uh, crafted and uh, signed a joint letter uh, to, um, to expedite um, the recommendations that have been longstanding. Next slide. In terms of the key priorities that were flagged in that letter, um, one is for the Latino or Latinx or Hispanic population, uh, reaffirming the importance of having a combined question on race and ethnicity. For Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander populations, uh, the desire to maintain the check boxes that have been uh, part of uh, the decennial uh, 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 practice uh, for, um, for a few decennials now, uh, in addition to maintaining the write-in um, option. Uh, for black populations, uh, it's to uh, encourage, continue encouraging um, the, um, the selection of detailed origins as well as black in addition to other uh, race and ethnic categories, as well as to include check boxes uh, in future data collection efforts in addition to the write-in options. And then finally, in terms of uh, the MENA uh, category, uh, we've just heard extensively um, from, from Helen in terms of um, various recommendations. Bottom line is uh, many stakeholders see the pressing need to make uh, implementation, to, to implement this as soon as possible. Um, and with all relevant U.S. Census Bureau data collections, including not only the 2030 census, but the American Community Survey and other data collections. Um, that concludes my remarks, and, uh, and I'll turn it back to Cherokee. Hi, this is Jim. I will, um, I think I'm going to cover this, Cherokee. So we have um, one discussant in the queue. Um, and again, please let us know if you, um, if you want to get in the queue, just indicate that. It
Interdeep, if you can unmute. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good morning. So I just, I'm just just wondering why there are so many uh, advantages of identifying and reporting subgroups and then subgroups and subgroups. Are there, is there a downside or a disadvantage to breaking it at such a micro level and perhaps losing out on the strength in numbers idea? I was wondering if you folks have any thoughts on that. Thank you. Hi, Andrew This is Nicholas. Thank you for your question. Nice to see you today. So we've heard from communities across the country that all groups are interested in having data for their particular populations. We continue to aggregate that data into the larger population categories that were required for the minimum reporting in the standards. But we also know that disaggregated detailed data is quite significant in terms of its ability to help us inform what we know about populations, not at an aggregate level, but about differences and similarities within and across groups. So we've heard that over the last decade from all communities, and that was part of our effort, even though we were not able to move forward with a combined question, that we did make those significant improvements to collect detail for all population groups in 2020. And we believe that effort should continue. So, so just to follow up, um, so do we have any substantive examples in terms of how these data may be used for, for sort of much larger political or social aspects? I know it's Absolutely. important to in these communities, definitely. Yes, it's, it's not just about having the population counts, but it's also the characteristics for those communities, and that's a big part of our effort to release the detailed DHC information that we talked about yesterday. Uh, for information on age and sex distributions, for the other data on households and families, as well as tenure. Those are the limited uses of characteristics in the decennial census. But as Karthik recommended and as others have said, uh, continuing to collect this detail on things like the American Community Survey will provide even more robust information on the socioeconomic and other status of different uh, groups within communities, not just at the highest aggregate level. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to, Arthur, if I may, is that okay? Or not? Or, oh, yes, please. I know we're pressed for time, but I also wanted to follow up that um, although, you know, in 2020 we collected more detail than ever, I do want to I do want to emphasize that we have historically have collected detail uh, ethnic and race responses in the census. So, for example, in 1980, when we first introduced the uh, Hispanic question, we collected detail Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban detail and also uh, Asian population and American Indian uh, tribes as well. So what's, what's new really is that we're collecting more specific detail for white and black groups that we have historically have not collected. Um, so we just want to emphasize that part. And as Nicholas mentioned, we have heard from stakeholders over the last few decades actually that more detail needed to be, uh, needed to be collected for the purposes of civil rights enforcement, voting rights, et cetera. With that, we'll um, go to Karthik. Thank you, and, and appreciate the uh, the affirmation of the importance of it's a both and, right? I mean, these race categories are larger categories, and it's not only how consequential it is for a variety of outcomes, but I've mentioned this yesterday. It is the way that certainly within Asian American populations, how people actually identify. Uh, and it's important, and I really appreciate the Census Bureau's deep listening efforts, and even those categories evolve over time. Uh, so just really grateful um, and to, to see that this is an ongoing learning process and a process of continuing improvement. Thank you, Karthik. Thank you. And any other questions in the queue? But I, um, I'm going to – I actually have a couple of questions myself, and one of them – I think is something that a lot of the NAC members are very interested in hearing about the timing of reconstituting the working group and moving forward. I know that a lot of us were, were hoping that we were going to get um, the updates to the race and ethnicity question on the 2020 census, but all of that was really kind of put to us a, uh, a stop at the end of 2016. So given that and, and given the fact that obviously I, I think it's still waiting for an OM director, what do you think the timing will be in terms of reconstituting the working group and moving forward? Thank you, James, for your, for your question here and for your comment. So 
we are ready to move forward. That's why we've talked about our research goals to explore what we see in the 2020 census results. You can see that they're lining up with the research topics that we undertook last decade. We want to be prepared when those conversations uh, will reemerge. Uh, there was an appointment of a new chief statistician last week from OMB, and we're excited to begin working with that office and other federal agencies about what we're learning and what they're learning in their data collections here now in the post-2020 era. We talked about the persisting problems. We acknowledged them with the separate questions design, and we also stand behind the research that we did in engagement to show that we have a solution for the decennial census and the ACS. So we're excited to take on those particular conversations here in the very near future. Okay, fantastic. Um, before I ask my next question, I'm actually going to go to uh, Yoma, who has, who has a question. Let's do the queue. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much. Um, I'll be uh, brief, and I want to also just recognize that my question may not be as sensitive, so Helen, just uh, correct me, too. So I'm just trying to understand whether there has been, because obviously I'm, I'm still new to the whole MENA category as part of the NAC. So I'm trying to understand, because part of MENA includes uh, sort of those who phenotypically look black. And I'm trying to figure out had there been a sort of an exploration or examination as to what is the implication of the category MENA, right, if it's an ethnicity group, to the black population, particularly those immigrants, say from Somalia, who may be recent immigrants and may not identify as black African American and so may check off sort of that MENA uh, ethnic box, but usually they would have checked off black African American. So trying to understand has that been unpacked? What are the implications of that, especially when we know that black African-American group um, is already undercounted? And we know that this country tends to sort of respond to you based on what you look like as opposed to maybe your ethnic category. So I'm just trying to um, but also recognize that Arab Americans have also uh, faced a significant amount of sort of challenges. So just trying to figure out is there a need for more research that better begins to unpack sort of that intersection of MENA and in particular the black population. Uh, thank you, Enoma. I, I agree with you. Yes, we don't have an answer to that. And the, 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 the short answer is that there is, um, there is a lot of um, confusion. Uh, I guess when people get a survey and they see um, a racial option and nothing else, they're probably going to um, default to that racial option. Um, we believe that in some ways it's a reporting category and it's a data aggregation category, but if people still identify strongly um, as black, that, that's fine. We just want to be able to aggregate the data on those, um, on those communities from Arabic-speaking countries that we can then um, consolidate it when necessary. We are not, the reason we think it needs to be presented as an ethnic uh, reporting category is for that reason because there are several people from the MENA region who identify as white, and there are a number of countries that identify, where the people identify as black and, and then something in between. So I, I, our intention is not to be able to take data away from the other race groups. It's rather to be able to have an end, you know, end, uh, yes, to have it both. Thank you. And I'll just briefly say, so then I think in that case, too, I think it's just, just like we're doing with the Hispanic population, then I think it's also important that we begin to also examine sort of the impact of MENA in other racial categories so that we're really clear about what are the sort of the implications, if any. But I really appreciate exactly what you're saying now, and to include as ethnicity allows also the racial category to also uh, be an option. Yes. Right, yeah, so thank you for your question very much. Uh, so I think what's really important is that keep in mind that when the MENA classification was developed over this past decade, you know, we were operating under the current standards that remain in effect, right, the 1997 OMB standards. And if you go and read the standards, um, you're going to find out, which a lot of people are not aware, that all the major race categories are actually grounded in geographic terms. So when, for example, when you look at, let's say, how, how is white defined, right? Does any of the original peoples from Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa? So that's uh, one of the, that's actually the reason why MENA is uh, classified as white. Any, any responses uh, from the MENA region right now are tabulated under the white category, and that's what happened in 2020. Um, 
One of the things I do one of the things I do want to make clear is that um, in order for MENA to be a separate category from white, that would be a, that would require a, um, a policy decision. The Census Bureau is a statistical agency and we report data, as you know. But in order to make it designated as a new minimum category, that would be an O and B decision. So, but however. One of the major research uh, projects that we're going to uh, in, that we're going to undertake, as we just described, is that we are going to look at MENA responses in the race question. How did folks uh, of MENA background, for example, report in the race question, including did they check black, the black box, the white box, Asian box, or did they write it in to some other race category? So we are going to look in that, and we'll be very thrilled and happy to report those results to you when the data is available. Thanks so much, a great question. And next up is Delane Compton. Uh, yes, I was just curious uh, if we can put the combined question on the ACS and what the obstacles are for moving forward on that. Thanks for your question, Delane. So before any survey is able to include the option for a combined question, that would require a change to the standards. The standards, in, as written in 1997, do allow for the use of a combined question, but only in observer-based reporting, not in self-identified reporting, such as in a census or a survey. Uh, so that's what we're talking about in terms of waiting for a policy change and a decision about the review of the 1997 standards. Okay, I don't see anyone in the queue, so I'm gonna ask my second question. Um, one of the big concerns of the American Indian Alaska Native community is that it actually saw the largest single increase of any population group in the 20, uh, 20 census compared to 2010. Um, in particular, it, it rose from 5.2 million to 9.7 million, which was over an 86% increase. Given this, there's been a lot of concern expressed within um, Native organizations and tribes about the potential impact of switching over to a combined question. Um, specifically, the concern is that by doing that, it will actually decrease the number of people who check the box of American Indian Alaska Native of single race. And that will have a particularly devastating impact on most tribes because most federal funding is actually tied specifically to those who check the box for American Indian and Alaska Native. So I guess um, the question is, given that, have you looked at um, or are you planning to look at the potential impact of a combined question and what impact it might potentially have in um, impacting not only American Indian and Alaska Natives, but other racial and ethnic groups, um, especially given the fact that um, even what we saw between 2010 and 2020, um, that increase seems to be driven in part by the race and ethnicity. So that we don't really think that American Indians grew quite as fast as, as that, um, and a lot actually had to do with the fact that people were checking the box who, who really should have been American Indian Alaska Native but hadn't checked the box previously. Thanks, James, for your comment. So I, I have a few things to say about this one. First. In our research last decade, looking at a combined question compared to a separate question, one of the major things that we found was that with a combined question approach and our follow-up re-interview with these populations, it was producing more accurate representations of how people self-identify, whether they report a single race, whether they report multiple, whether they report race and or ethnicity groups. It was just giving us more accurate information in terms of how they would truly self-identify. We know within the separate questions designs, that we did not get that type of accurate reporting to the same level that we have found with the combined question. And this was true across all communities. The big thing with the 2020 improvements that we've made is that we're seeing more clearly how people are responding within the separate questions approach. We see that people are still struggling with the design and trying to find ways in which they would self-identify uh, their particular responses. We know for multiracial and multi-ethnic populations that a combined question results in more accurate data for how they're able to report. There's a lot of confusion with the separate question design itself, and also when groups do not exist in the, in the listing of the race question, such as Hispanic or Latino. Um, but I don't want to characterize it as something that we see as a, a challenge or an issue, uh, particularly for the American Indian population. We also have evidence from our research and our outreach that there are people who are looking to report all of the identities that they have, and that's more complexity that we need to be aware of and take into account in our data tabulations. So just relying on something like an alone and a two or more tabulation, while that may have worked when the population was much smaller, 
20 years ago or not even collected in 1990 and earlier, we emphasize the complexity and the need to look at both alone in combination, alone or in combination, and also race by Hispanic origin, particularly for groups like American Indian populations or Pacific Islander populations where, as you've stated and others know, if you're looking at only the alone, you're missing half the population. So we welcome that opportunity to make sure that we can provide more accurate data on how people are self-identifying and as census, emphasize to other federal agencies and data users the need to look at all of the pieces within this complexity and not just one. And I guess just to follow up and, and then I'm gonna go back to uh, Delane or her question. Um, some of the concern is, I, I think among the American Indian Alaska Native is much what Yoma had expressed um, when she was having the conversation with Helen about MENA, which is, you know, we're concerned that potentially the changes of this, it's not to say that we, you know, that um, even among American Indians and Alaska Natives don't support updating um, the, the race and ethnicity question, but there are some concerns that in doing, it could very well end up being a zero sum game that one group, one population group ends up um, winning and at the expense of other population groups. Um, you know, we certainly understand and respect the need for people to self-identify and to report their own status, but I think there, there also are a lot of other concerns in, in how that comes about, especially given the fact that um, with a lot of the historically undercounted population groups, you know, we have access issues in terms of messaging. How do you get the message out about the changes? Are you going to do translations for all of those who speak non-English dialects? so that people understand that this is a big sea change and, and um, that what is actually reported is accurate because people actually understand how they're answering the question. Thank you, James. And, and we understood and took that on during our research last decade. Un unquestionably, we will continue to do that work and that important outreach to ensure that people understand what we're asking, what it means in terms of how the categories are then tabulated, and uh, what it could mean in terms of the future for understanding the statistics. That's a big responsibility for us, and we welcome that challenge. We're ready to take it on. Fantastic. Next up is Delane, and then we will go to Flo. Yes, I just was curious, what do we need to move forward on changing the standards? Like, what do we need to change the standards mentioned earlier with the Office of Management and Budget? Thank you, Flo. So, this is a conversation that is taking place today. It's a moment in our history in which we're having this discussion and it will continue. This is the next chapter in where we are. We've talked about what happened last decade with our research. We're talking about what we know from the separate questions designed in 2020. All of that is really informing this conversation. And so we encourage you to remain involved, to ask and make recommendations to the Census Bureau based on what we've presented and to be on this ride with us to think about how we can move towards advancing better data for the nation. The next question comes from Florencia Gutierrez. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's related to the question that was just asked. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what role we as advocates can play to push OMB to make the change to use the combined question and I'm also wondering, what is the holdup? Like, why are they still sitting on it? <laughs> I'll, I'll take the, that question because yes, the why. And the answer is really simple that we don't, we can't, you know, we're not in their heads. You need to ask them why. Um, but uh, really the, the bigger picture is that we, I think are coming to a critical point in a critical mass thinking, so to speak, where everyone, including OMB, recognizes that a revision needs to take place. So how do we make it happen? And part of the answer to that is unfortunately structural. We, need, uh, we needed a chief statistician in place to help shepherd through the bringing in and bringing together of federal statistical agencies to begin those discussions. That, uh, that piece of infrastructure is now in place and we are eagerly awaiting and conversing with OMB about the timing of when this might happen. And so, but it's imminent 
uh, from my perspective, but I really don't know because I don't. It's up to OMB to make these decisions of when to start and how to how to begin the process. But from my perspective, it's imminent. There's just too much momentum. Having said that, every little bit helps. So if you feel that that uh, what you want to do is to approach folks at OMB or elsewhere to express your concerns and urgency, uh, you should feel free to do that. But uh, I, it's not appropriate for me or the Census Bureau to ask you to do that. <laughs> That's something you have to do on your own. So I don't see any other questions in the queue, but I'm going to ask a follow-up to Flo's question, because um, I think this is really what's driving a lot of what the concerns are. Um, the, you know, obviously, this was put, at, put to a standstill when we had a, an administration that wasn't um, favorably looking at updating the question, given the fact that, um, you know, given that fact and given the concerns about what potentially could happen and having to stop again, do you think it's realistic that we can expect a final decision will be made on the OMB race and ethnicity standards before the end of 2024 when we have this opportunity and we have an administration that's supportive of, the, of updating the standards? I mean, I can I can answer that I don't have enough um, familiarization with this process, uh, being being in the in the, my position for only a few months, and I'll leave it to the other folks based on their experience, the, the subject matter experts who have actually lived this process, uh, to to see if they have anything more to to add. But my guess is it would be speculation. But if you guys want to add something, what you think, feel free to. Certainly don't want to speculate. Thank you, Director Santos, about what <laughs> might happen. But we can look back with our history and see that we have done robust research, outreach, and engagement on this topic. We have a wealth of data to present, and we're now bringing up to speed what we know from 2020, so that when this conversation, should it reemerge, we're ready to take part in that conversation and to provide all the evidence from our work about how we recommend that we could move forward. So that's why we want to be prepared and we welcome this opportunity. And, and that's actually a really great point, that when the conversation begins, it will be jump-started because we, we're sitting on a lot of information that's really useful to address this specific issue. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think all of us really believed that the, the Census Bureau should be in the position working with the OMB and other federal agencies, but it should hit the ground on this because it's not like we're starting – you know, with a clean slate on this. Um, but I, I see that, um, okay, let me see. No, I guess I'm looking at Flo's um, older question. One of the other questions I have is just kind of a practical question that I think we even see just in, in terms of the 2020 census data. Once the rates and ethnicity, assuming the rates and ethnicity standards are updated, how do you um, see the Census Bureau going about to resolve potential data issues? Because if we use it, for example, in the 2030 census, it's going to be like comparing apples with oranges with the 2020 census. Um, what ways, if any, do you think, um, as part of the planning, will you be able to do that so that we can have some meaningful comparisons with, um, you know, the, the data that preexisted the, uh, the updated standards? Thank you, Jim. That's, that's a big responsibility of ours, and we've shown how to do that with the 2020 results. 2020 and 2010 are not apples to apples. No census has been apples to apples in terms of race and ethnicity, but it's our responsibility to take on looking into the data, understanding where we've made positive improvements to make the data better, and explaining how you can and how you should not make comparisons to the past. So when we talked about the 2020 results last summer, that was a big part of our challenge to communicate what we know, why we know it, and also where we help uh, data users understand how to best use that data. So you can count on us to continue to do that in 2030 and beyond. We have this topic, which is a social construct, and social concepts continue to evolve. So we'll be there with you to help explain and help message uh, moving forward how to understand the data. Um, and that's that, a great, a great, I was going to say that's such a great response, uh, uh, and so thank you for, for making that, because we have evolved and things do change. And so we really need to be taking a look at this. So in, from my perspective, this is really urgent. So thank you. Looking at the 
time. We still have 15 minutes left, so I want to just do a last call for questions. Um, give everyone just a moment to think if they have anything else they'd like to ask. Just indicate. You can even just put your name in the chat. Um, because otherwise, what I'm inclined to do, if we can make up a little time today, that would be great and potentially move on to the next presentation. But I'll pause here for just a moment to see if there are any other questions. And while we're doing that, I, I want to throw it back to the, the census sneeze as well. If you have any further comments on this, just to close out the conversation, that would be wonderful as well. I think the only thing I would add, James, is that we are very much looking forward to sharing the information that we can explore on the topics that we provided today to help us learn more about the 2020 census and share that with the NAC. Uh, we expect that we'll have some of this work later in the year to help inform the conversations. And uh, I believe and expect that in our next NAC meeting, we'll have much more that we can say about where we are with this review with OMB, with the other federal agencies. So, we look forward to our next conversations with you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Nicholas. And I see Ioma has a new question, so we're going to go to Ioma. Hi, this is Ioma. So, uh, yeah, I think it's just a little bit more time. Um, so I'm just trying to understand um, when will we know uh, the race and ethnicity of those who check sort of a single race category or, mod or like when would we add, have more information about sort of the different kinds of racial ethnic uh, that was checked off? Are we going to have more information on that coming out soon? Thank you, Yoma. That's part of one of the topics that we presented today. So in addition to understanding the reporting patterns within each of the major categories, we're also looking at the reporting patterns within some of the race. So to understand from the internal data what patterns do we see? Did people check a box called SOR? Did they write in German, Jamaican, Lebanese, Mexican on that line? And how was it processed and what does it result in in terms of the tabulated data? We have other categories within SOR such as Brazilian that have not been tabulated in our census results before. That's part of our planning that we'll be able to produce these statistics to talk about uh, not just the SOR as an aggregate group but also within it what it contains. And so please definitely look forward to that research and information that we'll be sharing. So, Nicholas, can I just confirm, so will that information be, um, would it be, is it going to be published? Or is it, you're going to do the analyses and that, like, will you actually publish that in that level of detail? We're, we're planning to, at least at the national level, that's part of our planning for this work, that we'll be able to talk about the results that we know for the nation, for each and every category within these major groups, as well as the detail, and then talking about the reporting patterns that we see from the internal data to help inform this conversation about uh, what we know from the 2020 results. Okay, next up is John Sandoval. Thank you, James. My question for the Bureau is, obviously we've been talking a lot here about Nina as the, probably the next uh, you know, big change to happen. But I'm just curious, as you're going over the early results from 2020 and with all the depth of your research, are you seeing any emerging categories or, you know, what might it look like five to ten years from now? Is that anything you can, you can share with us in terms of some uh, kind of weather vein pointing to the future? Thank you. Hmm, that's a good question, any emerging terms. So, um, as Nicholas mentioned earlier, you know, back in 2010 census, we coded up to two write-ins per write-in line, and in the 2020 census, uh, we coded up to six write-in lines. Uh, we're still we're still internally reviewing and examining the data right now, and as uh, the research project that we mentioned earlier, one of them is to look at the detailed ethnicity and race kind of groups that were reported, and so we will look to see if there's anything unique or new as far as terms uh, are concerned. But if you look at our if you look at our extended food list that's available now on the technical documentation of the public law redistricting file, one thing that uh, that we mentioned also is that we expanded that code list significantly from the 2010 census. We actually added hundreds, if not thousands, of new race and ethnic categories to the to the 2020 code list that we did not code previously before. So, if you're curious about a particular term, you know we have in there, for example, like Latinx, actually on the code list. There's other terms that we know that other groups use. And so they're available. But if there's anything new that comes out, we'll be 
definitely um, we'll investigate and research it and perhaps also um, add it to the code list for 2030. But that all remains to be seen. I don't see anyone else in the queue. Oh, we do have one more. Um, Ioma, I will call on you, and then I will go back to me with one last question. Ioma. Sorry, it's minor. I know I'm sorry being a pest. This is Yomi Ruka. I'm being a pest. Um, There's just a minor question. Um, I think I noted that you all, you said you were providing six examples for, like, some of the racial groups, like black and Asian, but then nine for the Hispanic groups. And I'm just curious, is there a reason for that, and can that be expanded for the other groups, or is there a reason that's the case? So, Yoma, thank you for, for that comment. When we talk about the use of six examples, we're discussing that within our optimal design, which is the combined question design. The 2020 census, uh, as it moved forward, did have a number of improvements, but it was not the optimal design that we recommended where we had that focus and that equitable, but that equitable balance of six groups for each of the categories. So that, think about that in terms of how we recommend moving forward with that type of an approach. And I do want to, and I do want to address your question about um, about being a pet because they're not. <laughs> this is why we're here. We're here to answer your questions as best as possible, and we're always uh, available for any questions you may have. So, thank you for your questions. Yeah, I think I'm going to close it out. And um, one of these, I think, is just going to anticipate a recommendation that we may be making, which is. Um, you know, given the fact that you've indicated there's been a substantial body of research on this, I think one of the things that um, certainly outside stakeholders would really like to see is the information that you are currently that you currently have available to you that you're relying on to help make your final decisions and recommendations to the working group. So that would be of assistance. Uh, you don't have to comment on that. I think that will likely be something that we may be discussing as a recommendation. Um, the last question I have is really a, a uh, process question. Do you anticipate there will be federal, um, further federal register notices to um, solicit um, public feedback and stakeholder feedback based upon um, some of the pre-decisional recommendations that you'll be making before a final decision is made? Thank you, Jim. I would, would expect that that would be a direction coming from OMB as to whether or not to do that, so it's not coming from the Census Bureau. But I do, I do want to emphasize that historically that has been the case, that federal register notices are, re, um, are released and public comment is solicited. That's how it's been in previous, uh, back in the you know, late 80s and 1990s, leading up to the 97 standards when it was revised from the original 1977 standards. So I anticipate that they will be. But like I said, we don't know. We'll have to wait and see what the process holds. Yeah, I anticipate that as well. Okay, fantastic. Well, we're going to be about five or six minutes early, but I, you know, all of us really want to thank you and, and thank Director Santa for also elevating this because, as you probably know, talking about pests, the NAC has been a bit of a pest on this because we've really been pushing to, you know, reshape the conversation on updating the standards, and we really appreciate all the work that you're doing and your presentation today. Thank you, James. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, with that, we're going to turn back to Karen. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nicholas Meraris and Roberto for your presentation, and thank you, discussants, for your great presentations as well. Um, I believe we are going to make a small change to the agenda. Oh, we're going to stay with the blended base population presentation. Is that correct? Yeah, we are going with um, administrative workers to tell me that, please. Okay, so we are going to make a small change to the agenda, and now we are going to hear from Tom Mule about the quality of the administrative records data used in the 2020 census. This is Sean uh, Thank you, Tony. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, hello, everyone. As, uh, I'm uh, Tom Muley, uh, Special Assistant to the Chief of the Decennial Statistical Studies Division, and I'm happy to talk to you today about the quality of the administrative record data that was used in the 2020 Census. Uh, as part of doing the 2020 Census, we were pretty flexible with changes. So I have no problem being able to go a little bit earlier. Uh, next slide, please.
So there is the, the part of the admit the in the fall 20, uh, 20 the National Advisory Committee recommended that the Census Bureau brief the NAC at its spring meeting about the quality of the key administrative records data sources and being able to see and Census Bureau data collection and how accurate and complete the administrative records and linkages were for historically undercounted population groups. So today I'm here to give that update. As part of the 2020 Census, administrative records was a major area of research uh, that we conducted. Today I'm going to focus on the quality of administrative records that we use for enumeration, and then also how did we end up using information for characteristics uh, if they were not reported. Uh, this presentation, we're gonna be showing some preliminary numbers, and so these may be uh, updated in the future. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so first with using administrative records for enumeration, just would like to start a little bit about our non-response follow-up operation. If we were not able to get a response for the address, either through internet, people sending in their paper questionnaires, being uh, calling up our phone assistance centers, those unresolved addresses had to go to our non-response follow-up operation. As part of that operation, try to determine three statuses for the address. Is it occupied? If it is occupied, we try to get the roster and the characteristics we're trying to collect that we're talking about. Or we try to determine if the address is vacant. It is a housing unit, but nobody lives there. We also have other addresses, which we're trying to get a chance for enumeration, but they do not meet our definition of a housing unit. So we need to delete those or make them non-existent. And so with those, those examples could be businesses, or they could be a duplicate of a housing unit that we've already enumerated. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So when talking about the quality of the administrative record sources, one of the key things I talk, especially for enumeration, is that we use multiple sources to try to be able to enumerate the population if we're using an administrative record. So for administrative record occupied addresses, the multiple sources, we're using information from the Internal Revenue Service. So we're using 1040 filings, which generally start in February, uh, which usually goes through tax day of April 15th, but that was changed in 2020. We also use informational return information, uh, your W-2s, 1099s, those being information about where people may be living. We also use information from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Medicare Enrollment Database. That source definitely has more of a target for the elderly population. We did use the Indian Health Service Patient Database, that gives us coverage for the American Indian and Alaska Native population. We also use a file that we created at the Census Bureau, which is our Census Bureau Household Composition Key File. That information is we are able to process based on Social Security uh, uh, numerate uh, information, uh, being able to link children to their mothers or fathers. Uh, we're generally able to link children to both parents 66% uh, of the time, linked to a mother 20% of the time, and linked to only a father 4% of the time. So we're able to use that information to add children where they may not have already been seen. With our vacant and our, not, our delete non-existent determinations, two key pieces of information that we use is one from the United States Postal Service. We get information about undeliverable as address or UAA when we're doing the uh, mailings around Census Day. The postal carrier trying to deliver the mail, if he's not able to, will let us know it's UAA and also provide reasons about this is vacant or no such number. We also use information from the file that listed above, but also third party sources to see are we seeing signs of people living at that address. Uh, next slide, please. So with the quality of administrative records, also we want to show some of the results that we had from our research leading up to 2020. So this is results that we produced in 2017. When using administrative records, one thing concerned is that how are we using those, especially for populations that might be harder to count? So when we were doing our research, we were looking to see, okay, how are our projections for areas that had uh, increases of Hispanic origin population in the black group? 
be able to take advantage of our ACS estimates. And one of the things we're seeing with the approaches that we are doing is that as the concentration of the Hispanic origin population was increasing, we were doing less administrative record occupied uh, instances, and we were using, using less administrative records, and we were doing more full contact. So our research along the decade was this is the type of approach that we are taking for 2020. Uh, next slide, please. And also with the quality administrative records, we're going to talk about what we're able to use for characteristic imputation. If we ended up getting a response and we weren't able to, that response did not have the data, we use the information to fill it in. Or if we did need to use administrative records for enumeration, how could we use, what information could we use, and how confident were we in that information? So the first thing is that the first thing we looked at as part of this, talking about these administrative records, we were also including past census or American Community Survey responses. So we are including information about race, Hispanic origin, age, or sex that's already been provided to the Census Bureau. And also pointing out, this is not the first time we've done this. In the 2010 census, we used 2,000 census information for race and Hispanic origin. Uh, my colleague Andy Keller did a lot of research to see in working with the population and seaside SMEs to say, could we use additional information to be able to account for the missing data? So we went up looking at 2010 census personal responses with their Hispanic origin. We were able to see that the Social Security Numidant file with using the country of origin, they were able to uh, allocate uh, Hispanic origin 98% of the time. 98% of the time. Uh, the Census Bureau has put together a best a Hispanic origin file, taking into account Hispanic origin information that has been uh, provided to other agencies. And for that, that agreed 96% of the time. For race, we did are able to do a similar thing. We were able to look at the foreign country of a person from the Social Security Numidant file. That was agreeing 90% of the time. Information about race from other agencies, that was agreeing 92% of the time. And then also with age, being able to compare to the Social Security Numidant, which gets uh, mostly when people are born, that's the main source of how this uh, file is updated. We had a very high agreement of age. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is the usage of administrative records. I'd like to talk a little bit about the NERSU contact strategy. So next slide, please. So with our administrative record Occupy units, while we're, doing, while we're doing research in a decade to see if we could contact addresses one time during the non-response follow-up operation, we'd like to highlight for our self-response TEA the numerous ways that we are trying to contact people to try to get them to respond. We did numerous mailings during the self-response. While doing the non-response follow-up, we could get the interview at the door. But we also left the yellow, left the notice of visit so the person could be prompted to dial CQA, try to be able to complete the census that way. In addition for these cases, we also sent out another mailing one week later encouraging them to respond. Also, while non-response follow-up was going on, a household could decide to respond to the census. And if so, we would use that information. If at the end of data collection, we would use our administrative records information. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> For vacant and non-existent housing units, I'd like to highlight some of the things which we did, which we researched and uh, changed as we learned throughout the decade. We, as part of doing our modeling and determinations, we had, based on model, uh, mailings that we did around Census Day, at least one of those mailings needed to be undeliverable by the Postal Service. Then in 2020, we did another mailing around June to see, okay, was mailing again about eight weeks later, could the postal carrier deliver that again or not? One change that we did is that everybody got one contact. So everybody did get that, but how we ended up doing after that depended on the result of the June mailing. If that June mailing eight weeks later was undeliverable as addressed, we did only the one contact. The NERFU, the inter, you know, self response was open. If we got that, we did use it. Otherwise, we used our determination. For the remaining cases, 
we did end up doing the full contact strategy. Uh, so next slide, please. <clears throat> So let's highlight a little bit of our full contact strategy because after the 2018 end-to-end -end test, we did do another change related to administrative records. Our non-response follow-up uh, NERFU had three phases. Our first two phases were the phases which are contacting addresses to get uh, their cooperation, but we did end up getting to the final third closeout phase later, it was later in the NERFU operation. So when that was happening for an address, we looked and said, okay, we tried to contact the address numerous times. You know, we have not been able to do that. Can we use administrative records again and then being able to concentrate our field resources for these other remaining cases? So we did end up using cases where administrative records, where we did use a roster. One change in 2020 is we did do if we had information only from one source, we did use only the population count and not the characteristics. And we also had to identify additions they could and delete addresses. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, so then the, with the census 2020 happening, we did have some uh, implications. So with that uh, next slide, uh, the two main things that we had to deal with was one, the, the Internal Revenue Service, they changed the tax filing deadline uh, in 2020. Uh, it did change from April 15th to July 15th. So we did modify our procedures to account for that. We were getting monthly deliveries of the IRS tax return, so we, those continue to come on a monthly basis, so we did have to adjust to the July 15th deadline. And then also the non-response follow-up operation of the census. It changed from uh, the May and did not start until uh, August. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide highlights some of the revisions that we're able to do for the administrative records modeling. We did end up doing changes with concerned about the vacant and delete addresses or 2.2 million addresses that are coming out of our, our modeling determination. We said, hey, we want them to be able to have full contacts. We did introduce a occupied model for American Indian on reservations. We adjusted the rosters to account for the late tax filing deadline. Uh, we did end up closing our, during our closeout phase. We did add a part where if we had information from a single source, we would use only the population count. We did implement an off-student uh, campus initiative to try to account for those students who might have went home uh, during the uh, pandemic. And we also did an additional administrative record usage in four parishes in Louisiana in October where hurricanes were occurring. Our documentation in 2020 definitely has more information about this. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and just to highlight, with the census edit and imputation process, uh, during, while this is happening, the use of past census or administrative records, that comes as part of their assignment phase. So if we don't have information from a respondent, we look to be able to see if we can use this information to assign that to a case instead of having to get it from our other imputation procedures. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so for today, I'm going to go over some of the preliminary quality measures that we have from the administrative record uh, usage. In the place of time, I'm not going to read each one of these questions and kind of get right into the uh, results to be able to share with you today. Uh, so next slide, please. Yep. Uh, yep. So next slide, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so focusing on questions related to our modeling and our enumeration, so how many actual 2020 AR enumerations were based on administrative records? So out of our 151.8 million addresses nationwide, 4.59% were resolved using high-quality administrative records. 3.2% were determined to be occupied, 1.15% were vacant, 0.24% were uh, non-existent or delete, they did not meet our definition of a housing unit. We did want to break down the AR occupied a little bit more. Earlier showed, hey, could it could have been used after one visit, or did we use all of it at the end during our closeout operation? Breaking these case, our occupied cases down further, we were able to see that 92% of our AR occupied cases, the 4.468 million, those were our cases which we researched all decade, which were determined after one visit. 
With closeout operation, we had 186,000. But we put, during, the, during the part of the closeout operation, we had rosters and available characteristics. And 188,000 were closed out with using only the population count. And both of these were 0.1% you know, of all of the addresses in the 2020 census. Uh, next slide, please. And how does our administrative record count compared to uh, census, re uh, census responses? So we took, we took advantage that we had done our modeling on all of the addresses, and so we were able to compare our results to self-response addresses and then also those that were determined from a nursery householder. In addition, especially with self-response, we were able to take into account, did the control system get the response before July 30th or afterwards? Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So with comparing the results to uh, the, the administrative record enumeration to the census self-responses, we are able to see that with comparing our administrative record to self-responses that came in before July uh, 30th, we had an agreement rate of 83.8%. We were very happy to see that. We were also able to see that self-responses that came in afterwards, those had a result of 74.4%. So a little bit more time, we were seeing a little bit more degradation. And also in comparing to NERFU householders, so now we also have a delay in time, plus also we end up having a change in mode with an interviewer involved. Those had agreement around 66%. Uh, next slide, please. And it's also talked about availability. When we did have to use these administrative record enumeration cases, how often did we have age, sex, or his race or Hispanic origin? Uh, we, had, uh, age, we had age and sex about 96% of the time, and then having even race or Hispanic origin had 83% of the time. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and then also send some information related to how we use for characteristic imputation. So next slide. So also a tight count, when we did have to use either past census or administrative records, we're looking at the 331.4 million people in the census. Generally, when we had to use the information, we were able to use past census or American Community Survey information more often. So for race or Hispanic origin, we were able to use that about 3.2% of the time, whereas compared to other sources, it was about 1.5 or 0.9% of the time. Uh, and age and the results are there for age and sex as well. Uh, next slide, please. And the last thing we'll talk about is, okay, we had this, uh, we had this race or Hispanic origin information, but how is that comparing to census you know, responses that we did have? So we did do some additional analysis where we were able to take census self, self, census, self, response, self census responses and link them to our administrative record information. So with 14 categories of race or Hispanic origin, so the race are the six alone commonly categories or two or more races, with looking at these 14 categories, we're able to see that the census and the administrative records are putting the people in the same cell 89% of the time. Uh, main instance for the differences, based on the pre presentation earlier, with the more multi-reporting of race in the 2020 census as compared to 2010. Uh, next slide, please. Yep. So these are a summary of the uh, results that the JBO shows related to the administrative record quality. Uh, happy to be able to share those with you today. Hopefully, that's able to provide you with a little bit more information about the quality of the administrative record that were used in the 2020 census. Uh, thank you. Okay, I think we are ready for the discussion. Thank you. Uh, greetings, this is Linda Deep, and uh, I, this is my second term on the on the MAC. It's been a pleasure to serve. So I do some consulting now. I retired last year from Duke University uh, and did compliance work there. Um, next slide, please. So I can't see the full slide. Is that Let 
That's okay, Tony. I have it open on my iPad as well, so maybe I can look there. Um, yeah, good now. So, um, first of all, let me thank um, our chair, Jim. He helped put this uh, presentation together, and this was sort of a last-minute effort. So I apologize for that. And also, Tom, thank you for your very detailed, comprehensive uh, presentation. As you know, administrative records are sort of a mystery to most of us. So you clarifying and the, providing the detail is very helpful. So we have, of course, we'd like to first uh, commend the, the transparency and the authentic information that's been uh, provided by the Census Bureau, and uh, that includes the process of choosing our case, closing out cases to the NRFU, the type of administrative records used, use of past census, and, and of course, the further detail on how that, that, what that meant in terms of reporting the findings. Um, and the Bureau also clearly is prioritizing the efforts to improve the quality of the administrative records for, for future surveys. Next slide, please. So census staff are working with community partners and especially the tribes, which is very, very encouraging, and I'm sure they've seen the gains in, in doing that. So they, uh, that's helped them identify high-quality administrative records not presently used by the Census Bureau, uh, encouraging tribal, state, and local governments and non-government organizations to provide access to those records. And of course, the efforts to improve the quality of the administrative records used by the Census Bureau have led to initiatives to facilitate the MOUs to limit the use of ARs and protect the privacy of information in those administrative records. As you all know, you know, there's a definitely a, a clear need and an advantage on using administrative records. But there's also a, a sort of the other side of it, of course, is to where you draw the line and, and to sort of balance the, the accuracy and also the privacy issues. So, for example, working with tribal governments to obtain records that are higher quality than other available records, such as tribal enrollment records and health records, which essentially are, are, are um, hopefully more accurate and reliable at the ground level. So the census you are reaching out to the tribes is, is obviously a very helpful way to do this. Next slide, please. Um, so there's been made a uh, reference to these slides, and I apologize if your slides number don't exactly match uh, Tom's slides. But the, so we have several questions, and some of those may have been answered in your presentation, Tom. But uh, on slide 68, it indicates that the administrative records were used to update addresses, address records in the master address file. So the question is, how many records were updated? in the MAF as a result of using the administrative records in the 2020 census. And of course, uh, if there's no time to respond to some of those questions, you'll see some of those uh, included in our recommendations, and I'm sure there'd be other venues to, to get a response to those questions. The other one is what percent of records uh, updated in the MAF in the 2020 census are in update leave areas, update enumerate areas, and remote Alaska areas? And I might ask Jim to, uh, after I complete my presentation to sort of elaborate more on the, on the tribal issues. Next slide, please. So uh, on slide 69, it identifies the sources of high quality ARs. So how recent are those administrative records? For example, the tax years for the federal tax returns that were used. Is there a process for purging administrative records as more updated records become available? And if so, uh, what are some of the guardrails or what are some of the processes used for that purpose? Um, what other federal agencies are the source of administrative records? And I think you provided some information in the presentation, Tom. But uh, for example, I have not heard any discussion or mention of the EEO forms from businesses, which uh, you know, being part of the federal contractor and doing this work for a few years, I know how seriously the, both the federal contractors and other uh, organizations take this EO one business. And so I was wondering what the usefulness of that is and how those data are used in addition to the ways in which OSCCP or EEOC use, they are use that information. Um, are the individuals who, whose air administrative records are used by the census informed that their records can be used for that purpose? Um, and do the individuals in fact have a choice to opt out? Uh, 
um, not clear as to how that process works. Next slide, please. Um, one of the slides identifies the AR determination for the percent of Hispanic population by block group. Is it possible then to the data to be provided by other race and ethnic subgroups? Next slide, please. The census presentation identifies how administrative records were used in NRSUs for households receiving mail among those households for which AR were used to impute their, these characteristics. What percent had non-traditional mailing addresses and did not receive any of the mailings identified on slide 73? So the first attempt, the second attempt, and, and then they, didn't, they never got it. What percent had a head of household who was a person of color? That is anyone who's not Hispanic white. What percent had one or more children age five and under? And that is, in some ways gets to the undercount of, of population in this age group. What percent in update leave areas? And as you can see, the remote Alaskan areas. Next slide, please. Um, on slide 17, it appears that the administrative records fit into the NRSU full contact strategy. So we've listed four questions or three questions and some sub-questions here, which essentially, you know, ask for sort of more detail uh, on the NRSU. For example, what percent of group quarter cases were cl closed during the AR? Among those NRSU cases closed out by AR, what is the breakdown that percent of the number of attempted contacts, one, two, three, or multiple contacts? What percent of proxy interviews were supplemented by data from administrative records? Next slide, please. So closing thoughts and recommendations, and of course, uh, these are also going to appear in our more comprehensive recommendations from the NAC. Administrative records play an important role in filling in the gaps for missing or incomplete survey responses or reconciling multiple responses. In recognizing the need for high quality ARs, it's important that the Census Bureau not use ARs as a substitute for improving its effort to obtain self response from historically undercounted populations. Obviously, a more care and, uh, and attention to this group needs to be, is, is critical. Not use administrative records as a shortcut to close out the NRSU to make the numbers look good, but of course we believe in, in, in your uh, mission to provide the most reliable and accurate information to the public. Um, administrative records should be available as a fail-safe measure to be only used, if necessary, with the goal to obtain 100% counts through self-response or direct interviews in uh, the non-response follow-up. Next slide, please. The Census Bureau should uh, enhance its transparency, though we've come a long way, obviously, by publishing detailed data describing the use of ARs in decennial ACS and other annual and periodic surveys. Um, in addition, you know, just a thought that in addition to doing it for all of those individual uh, reports and surveys, perhaps it's possible to develop a core set of uh, criteria that may apply to a majority of these surveys and these uh, reports, and then just have to note those where there are nuances that are not including that in that set of the core uh, characteristics. Um, those descriptions should identify the source and ages of the ARs and their limitations. Population counted by use of AR should be broken down by race, ethnic subgroups, age, and housing tendencies. Next slide, please. And I believe that's the last slide. The Census Bureau should again attempt to improve access to high quality ARs by better educating the tribes. Because I think the trust, as, as it's been uh, pointed out in other presentations, trust is, is a huge and a very important or a critical element of this work. Um, NGOs and other non federal sources of how they are used and protected, tribal consultations to resolve concerns about and the sovereignty of the data, streamlining the process and means by which ARs are produced to the, uh, are presented to the Census Bureau, improve the process of negotiating, reviewing, and implementing the MOUs. Next slide, please. And of course, we go to public comment. Um, if we have time, Jim, I was wondering if you wanted to add something here. 
So I guess that, um, just a couple of points. And, and by the way, thanks so much, Tom. We really we really appreciate all the work that you do. Um, you know, as I had mentioned, um, just in corresponding with Tom leading up to this, um, we really appreciate the efforts that um, you know Tom and his team did in reaching out to the American Indian Alaska Native community during 2020 um, census operations. Um, I think the only disappointing thing is that we had some tribes that were willing to provide administrative records in light of um, what they feared would be an undercount, and we found out it was just too late in the process to do that. Um, I, I guess the only thing I would just, um, just two points I would just add, particular to the um, American Indian Alaska Native community, um, and one is that we do have a concern about the quality of some of the administrative records that are used. Um, for example, there was a recent um, Indian Health Services study that found that death certificates underreport American Indian Alaska Native status by approximately 30 percent. So, um, you know, we certainly understand that your, your office uses a variety of records to kind of complement one another, so you're trying to fill the gaps even in other administrative records. But again, I, I think the, the concern that we have from Indian country is that many of those records just simply aren't going to, you know, aren't going to adequately, um, you know, identify um, American Indians and Alaska Natives. And to that end, I guess my question to you will be just kind of building on um, a conversation we had a couple of years ago, which is what steps do you think the, your, your department needs to take to build up trust with communities like um, tribal nations um, to get them to facilitate your gathering of even higher quality and more accurate and complete administrative records? Yeah, thanks for the question, Jim. I think one thing, as Director Santos was saying, is we've, we've been continuing to reach out to the tribes and see, being able to see, can we get some tribes to be able to provide their information? And if we, that is able to happen, then can we be able to do some analysis to show how them providing the information helped us improve their account? And if we're able to do that, then we might be able to get more tribes. So we do look, and then we can kind of continue to work with you and others to see if we can try to get them to uh, uh, part participate with us. No, thanks so much, and I appreciate that. I, I will just um, allude to something that I think we discussed previously, which is um, one of the other big hurdles that we'll have to overcome is the data sovereignty issue, because you know, especially with tribal enrollment records, which which are are very high quality, and highly accurate records for, for helping identify missing populations on reservations and off reservations. Um, those are obviously something that the tribal nations hold as sacrosanct. Um, so we, you know, we really, that's part of, I think, what we'll need to work with the Bureau in doing is building up those levels of trust so they understand that they're not waiving concerns about data sovereignty by, you know, by providing the Census Bureau with record. So I believe we have one question um, comment in the in the chat. Yes, we'll we'll start with um, Florencia Gutierrez first, and then followed by Yelma. Okay. So please go ahead. Can you hear me? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um. Thank Thank you so much for the presentation. I I just had a question about. Um, the effectiveness of admin records as it pertains to young children, how good are they at um, identifying them um, and connecting them to households? Yeah. yeah, thank you for your question. So one thing that we've seen, with the usage that we mostly did for the 2020 census, it was when we were reducing contacts. So we were trying to set a very high bar for using those. One thing which we uh, learned, that we kind of knew going in, was that children who were born between January and April 1st of 2020, they are not on tax form. They get uh, included the next year. So like one of our lessons learned this time is how can we include those children being potentially to link them to their parents and include them as part of our uh, post-processing. So that was uh, one of our lessons learned. And there's also, we were talking yesterday about how using administrative records. So if we're using administrative records in more of a coverage improvement aspect going along, there might be more aspects along those lines where being able to help out the count. Great. And, and I don't know if you have um, connected with the child advocacy community, um, but just like 
the American Indian community appreciated the, that partnership. I think it would be great to form that, those kind of connections with um, the child advocacy community to ensure that we can get the best use of admin records for, for that population. And we've been more than happy to, to work with you. Yep, thanks. Yoma and then Andrea. Thank you. Hi, this is Yoma Iruka. So thank you again for your presentation. Um, so I just have maybe two or three clarifying questions. I want to make sure I confirm. So basically your, your analysis is basically showing that, you know, administrative records is really limited in its ability to, I think, address race ethnicity, at least based on the percentage I saw. And so even to Florencia's uh, earlier comment, there is the issue probably of the race ethnicity and also by age group. So just for me, it's trying to figure out has there been analyses looking at the extent to which America, uh, administrative records can actually be used to uh, sort of address, you know, race, ethnicity, and eat also by uh, age, just one. Um, and then the other one is obviously you sort of talked about multiple, at least imputation, and I do do imputation, and it is, I know we, it is a, a, a good statistical tool, but I also wonder whether there's any concerns about imputation, particularly using whether it's, it's the, sort of the nearest neighbor hot deck. And, and to what extent is, is there any concerns within the uh, staff community about some of the imputation methods, especially for something as high stakes as this, especially for groups that are likely undercounted? So, again, I'm just trying to uh, make sure that some of the um, staff methods may not be, you know, uh, impacting particular groups uh, and communities. And then my other question was really around the, I think, really, uh, Inderjeet kind of talked about that, which is really the, how, whether administrative records can actually address group quarters, right? So the extent to which it can really address whether you're in, in institutions, you know, colleges, et cetera, et cetera. So just want to figure out who is administrative records potentially not good for and the extent to which the Bureau has really gone deep uh, around that. Thank you. Yep, yep thanks. Yeah, so for, with race and Hispanic origin, we were seeing lots of agreement, like when we were comparing the American Community Survey, 2010, you know, census responses. But one thing, especially from the earlier presentation earlier today, we saw that the changes that we did to the question wording in 2020 and also the additional processing to capture more information, we were seeing that we're getting more multi-responses. So one of the things we're trying to do for 2030 is what things can we kind of do to that that if we have similar changes like that in 2030 based on changes, are there things that we can do to try to compensate? Because for 2010, for 2020 with doing this, we just did a direct assignment. So what lessons can we learn uh, going forward? Uh, we are looking for 2030. For the, if we do have to do imputation, we are researching. What is the best method for us to uh, uh, be able to do that? In the group quarters, uh, the Census Bureau is researching how we're going to be doing the 2030 group quarters information enumeration. And I think as part of the discussion is how does administrative records uh, get used, and that's probably something to get discussed with you guys throughout the decade. Okay. Where we are on time, I'm going to, um, Andrea, I want you want to close out with your question. Okay, great. And I will try to be quick. Hello, Andrea Centino with the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Um, so, I, you know, to build off of the questions that you've already received, and to kind of flip the, I think, the perspective a little bit, I'd like to understand what can the Census Bureau tell us about the populations that cannot be matched to administrative records or that are not able to, the individuals who are not able to be assigned a protected um, identification key. So are those populations, is that kind of subset of people who are not able to, where administrative records may not be working well, are they likely to be historically uh, undercounted populations, are there certain characteristics um, of that population that we need to understand better why administrative records may not be working as well? Because looking at the data you just presented, it seemed like in the non-response follow-up group, there was not as much, um, uh, not as much, um, the, the, the percentage match for the administrative records in that particular group were not as high and hard to count populations. Um, obviously, non-response follow-up is incredibly important for hard to count populations. So better understanding 
that relationship there and whether the Census Bureau is going to provide more information about the reliability of certain records for different population groups. Yep, that is something which we're going to be continuing to research. Uh, how can we use administrative records? And one thing with, with COVID going on, it was with getting a cooperation, but also getting responses, especially proxy responses. Uh, are we able, going forward, are we able to get more information that we can link? Can we research other ways of us being able to link that compared to the protected identification key assignment that we've done so far? So there are definitely things along those lines. Can we do things along the way of a coverage possible improvement that we did not do for 2020? Uh, are there other data sources like supplemental nutrition assistance programs that might be targeting historically undercounted populations, using those more in a coverage improvement as compared to a reducing contact approach might have benefits? So these are definitely things along these lines that you're going to re be researching and we can definitely be sharing with you as we develop our plans for 2030. Can I make a, a couple of comments before uh, we, we switch over? Um, this, is, this is actually a really important area for thinking about the 2030 census. And uh, if any, any of the folks have listened to any of my, some of my media interviews, I talk about how we can't simply start with what we did in 2020 and try harder, like with more administrative records. We really need to think about how we're going to come to grips with the hard-to-count populations. And I, uh, I honestly think that, that administrative records hold the key, but maybe not in the way that people immediately think, because I think that administrative records are fabulous for the easiest to count population. Yet if we solicit and then send multiple mailings to the easy to count population, folks that are gonna end up responding anyway, we're spending resources that we could conserve and put into the harder to count communities. And, and so I want us to, and, and I've been advocating for a heavier reliance on administrative uh, records, uh, but for the folks where th that typically we know they're going to respond anyway. Uh, so don't be surprised if you see that. That's my my mindset. That doesn't mean that's what we're going to do. It's the you know the 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 subject matter experts come up with the the research agendas. I I do the priorities and goals and hey think about this. Um, so but but. I hope it's not in. I hope it's not in conflict with where you are going, because if you if you take the the hierarchy of information quality, it goes self response, administrative records the way we were using them, high quality type of thing, then proxy response, and uh, and then uh, you end up with sort of like imputation. So. Um, Let's keep that in mind that administrative records is actually better than proxy response. And if we push this too far, we're going to get a really large proportion of proxies, um, and which we kind of did, uh, I think, this time around. Uh, but correct me if I'm wrong, folks. Um, and so, you know, I think we really need to be thinking outside the box. So thanks for listening. Okay, so Cherokee, I believe we are concluding the session at this time. Is that correct? Yes, I was speaking in on mute. Yes, I want to turn it back over to you at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Tom Yule. Thank you to our discussant. We very much appreciate this conversation. Um, so now it's time for a short break. We will take a 10-minute break. We'll come back at 1.13. Uh, and at that time, uh, we will have our presentation on the blended base for population estimates. So we'll be back in a few minutes.
break has concluded, I would now like to turn the call over to Karen. You may continue. Thank you very much. Welcome back from the break, everybody. Uh, so now we will hear from Ben Bolander and Eric Jensen, who will present the blended base for population estimates, followed by discussant Andrea Centino, who will present her thoughts before the committee begins discussion. And I just want to point out to everyone that at 1.40 p.m. we will have to pause the session so that we can have public comments. Uh, and after the public comments period has closed, then we will resume the discussion. So with that, please take it away, Ben. Thanks, Karen. Um, and thank you for everybody being here today. Uh, my name is Ben Bolander. I'm a senior technical advisor for the population division. Um, I've been in in POP and in estimates now for over a decade, so I've, I've spent a lot of time on estimates development and methodology. Um, my co-presenter here is Eric Jensen. He's the senior technical expert for demographic analysis, uh, also in the population division. Um, demographic analysis is one of two main coverage measures that we use to sort of check the coverage of the decennial census. So one is the post-enumeration survey, um, the other one is demographic analysis, which is an administrative records-based uh, census independent uh, estimate. Um, okay, next slide, please. Um, so just to give you a brief overview of what we'll talk about, um, first I want to make sure you get some population estimates program background. So what it is, why do we do it, what, do we, what is it we need to do, that kind of thing. Um, second, I'll talk about our, what we call a vintage, vintage 2021 estimates base considerations. So what that means is um, in terms of vintages, every year we create a new set of population estimates that goes back to the previous decennial census to the current period. So in vintage 2015, we went from the 2010 census to the year 2015. So in vintage 2021, we're going from the 2020 census or April 1st, 2020 to uh, July 1st, 2021. Um, third, we'll talk about the blended base, um, which is the method that we've developed to sort of account for some challenges that we've had uh, getting all the decennial census data that we would normally get. Um, and we'll show you just some very high level results. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about next steps and ongoing research. So what are we going to do in the future? Next slide, please. Okay, so starting off, um, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with it, but the Population Estimates Program is the, uh, the program that creates the official population estimates for the U.S states, counties, by demographic characteristics, and also cities and towns uh, for their total population. Um, they're the official measure of population for every year that doesn't end in a decennial census. Um, and they're mandated by federal law. Uh, they get used as um, population controls, the denominators. So the American Community Survey uses the estimates data um, as a denominator. Uh, the CPS, uh, Current Population Survey, uses it as a denominator. Um, a lot of major, you know, uh, death rates from National Center for Health Statistics use our estimates as a denominator and so on. Um, it's also used for academic and business research um, and for program planning in public and private sectors. So, um, you know, deciding if there's enough funding or if there can be funding for public transportation in a, a city or town would likely use data that we produce in the estimate. Um, and like I said, every year we produce a complete time series from the previous decennial census through to the current year. Um, so this estimate series goes from April 1st, 2020 to July 1st, 2021. Next slide. Now, normally um, we would use the decennial census as what we call the population estimates base. So what, what we do with our estimates products typically is not so much counts, and it's not a survey, 
what we do is we estimate change using birth, death, migration. Um, and then we add that to the most recent decennial census to get our current estimate of the population. Um, so in this year, uh, based on 2020, um, we had a number of challenges that caused us to sort of take a different route, at least for the time being. Um, the main one, and there's, there's a few um, items about this schedule constraints. So we didn't know um, when we were getting ready to produce data for Vintage 2021 when we would receive internal decennial census files or when we would receive files that had the uh, quite high level of detail that we need for making the population estimates. So, for example, um, in order to make our county level estimates, we need to start with a file that has uh, population by nation, state, county, um, by 100 uh, plus single years of age, sex, um, 31 races, so that's the OMB uh, races alone or in combination, and two Hispanic origins. And we need that for every county in the country, and we need it for the resident population, the group quarters population, the household population. Um, so. It's, it's a lot, um, and we weren't sure when uh, those types of things were going to be available. And it turns out that full characteristic detail was not available by the time that we needed to produce estimates for the 2021. Um, and because we haven't seen them, uh, research is needed to determine the suitability of the 2020 census data for use in the estimate space. So we need to look at it and make sure that there's um, Everything is demographically plausible um, that we can get uh, that, that it suits the purpose for making estimates. Um, now, a lot of the, the stuff that's been released publicly is, you know, 100% fine. Um, but we're talking about a lot of detail, and it's taking some time for the folks in the research and methodology area to uh, develop ways for differential privacy to interact with the sets of data to produce um, accurate public statistics. Um, and they're still working on that. So uh, differential privacy requirements are still in development. We're still, uh, as you heard yesterday, trying to work out what the DHC is going to look like. Um, and the last challenge, uh, which is not likely to go away um, with any stretch of time, is that as of now, the plans for the final differentially private census 2020 file is not going to include um, variables that we typically use. So uh, the estimates program uses modified race, so where some other race is uh, redistributed to the O and B alone or in combination groups. Um, they do that primarily because it's really hard to get administrative records on birth, deaths, or migration that have some other race, and that there's some uh, methodological questions about how you would estimate that correctly in the first place. Um, it is not planned to have math ID, so the geolocator essentially, so that for households, so that we can do um, geographic updates when county or, or city or place boundaries shift. Um, and as of now, we don't know if we're going to be able to do linkages between the the micro level census picked records and things like tax returns or um, birth records so that we can uh, get race and Hispanic origin for those um, components of change. So the main reason that we created a blended base is because producing estimates using the decennial census as we have for the last few decades wasn't on the table for this year. It, the data wasn't available. Um, and it, it may be in the future, but we're not there yet. So based on that, um, we essentially had to do a redesign of how we think about the population estimate space. Um, so like I said, what we need to start with for the estimates process, which is shown to be pretty accurate in measuring components of change, is we need nation, state, and county population 
by full demographic characteristics and universe, like GQ, household, um, institutional, non-institutional. So when we need that amount of data and we can't get it from Decennial at the moment, what other option do we have? Um, so what we, what we researched and developed was a blended approach. So the high-level overview is that we took the vintage 2020, so the end of last decade's time series based on 2010, um, full detail county level population estimates by universe. Um, and we controlled that to two other data sources. The other two being the decennial census population totals that you can see in the PL94 171 release um, that have had differential privacy applied to them. And to demographic analysis, uh, national estimates by age and sex. Um, the decennial census uh, pop totals did have differential privacy applied to them, but all indications are that it didn't distort county level totals or state level totals or uh, enough to be a concern. Um, and demographic analysis not only allows us to get uh, some updated characteristics for the current time period, um, but also as, as we'll see, it helps out uh, not really correcting, but mitigating uh, a few aspects of coverage that the decennial census has had um, documented for a while. So what are the benefits? Um, well, it doesn't access the unprotected 2020 data. So we're not going to the census edited file, you know, before differential privacy is applied at all, which means there's no uh, associated privacy loss budget risk to that. Um, it also, like I said, it mitigates, not corrects, but mitigates um, some census coverage issues. Uh, and it is consistent with decennial totals that have already been released. So it matches exactly with the decennial county totals that have come out. Now the main limitation of this method is that whatever inaccuracies were in vintage 2020 could have gotten carried over. So if um, we got the age distribution in the county uh, wrong for whatever reason, that would still be in this blended base. If we um, misallocated between Hispanic and non-Hispanic or uh, black and white in the estimates themselves, it would be in the blended base. Um, but that said, we don't have the data from the decennial census to be able to um, correct for those at this point. Um, we're still waiting on a solution for modified race. Um, and the characteristics data, I believe, is scheduled to come out next year at some point. Uh, next slide. This is Sean Bank. Can you check to make sure we're on the right slide for you? We're on the right slide. Thank you. Oh, wait. Oh. Uh, yeah, Ben, we should have been on slide 42. Oh, yeah. for that Sorry. Section. It, got, it got bumped forward. Yeah. Um, those were the points that I, I just made. Um, so the, the overview is the blend comes from our vintage 2020 post sample estimates, uh, demographic analysis by age and sex, the 2020 decennial totals. Um, and the rest of it, I think we just talked about. So, sorry about that other slide. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a high-level graphic overview of what we just talked about. Um, so this is the blended base process for the nation, states, and counties. For sub-county areas, we did something a little different. Um, but for the nation, state, and counties, uh, if you can see the blue lines on the top are the 2020 census. And the 2020 census controls are used uh, to create the blend at every level of geography. So it controls the national blend, it controls the state blend, the county blend. Um, and on the bottom there in the orange, you can see the vintage 2020 data. Uh, so the post central estimates contribute to all three levels of geography as well. 
Um, and demographic analysis, the, the yellow box there in the middle, is only available for national level data. So the age sex data from that contributes to um, the national level blended data, which uh, this is a top-down approach like we often do in um, the estimates program. So we start at the highest level of geography and then we create the next lowest level and control it back so that everything adds up and then we create the next lowest level. So in this case, state agrees with nation, county agrees with state and so on. Um, and finally, to make sure everything added up properly, uh, we took the county at the bottom and aggregated to create the final blended base for all levels of geography and characteristics. Um, next slide. Okay, so briefly, uh, we'll go over some blended base results. Um, <clears throat> so the high level points are that because of the 2020 controls, the census controls, the resident population totals in the blended base exactly match the 2020 census redistricting data for the nation, states, and counties. So it would have been the same for totals if we'd have used either the 2020 census or the blended base because they're, they're identical. Um, for the national resident population by age, so in this case, age 0 to 84 and 85 plus, um, and the sex distribution, it exactly matches the distribution in the 2020 demographic analysis. So totals come from census, age and sex at the national level come from DA. Um, and race, Hispanic origin, uh, age, sex at the lower levels of geography all reflect the vintage 2020 population estimates as controlled to DA and the 2020 census. Um, and the last point there uh, is that you can actually see that the undercount um, for young children in the 2010 census, so age 10 to 14 in 2020, and in the 2020 census, age zero to four, um, you can actually see that it's mitigated by incorporating DA into the blended base. Um, next slide. Okay, so this is um, a tool that demographers use to look at uh, age and sex distributions and compare time series, or not time series, uh, compare different uh, versions of data. So in this case, um, you see that middle line there with the zero millions. Both sides of this chart are positive. It's just males are on the left and females are on the right. So it doesn't really matter how far to the left or right the, the lines are. It matters how far are they from zero. So um, for the zero-year-olds, for example, you can see that there's just slightly less than two million um, males and a little bit less for females. Uh, the four series that we have mapped on here are the blended base and the three primary components that we had talked about. Um, so the yellow dotted line, which is probably, you might not be able to see depending on your resolution, um, is the 2020 demographic analysis for the nation by age and sex. Um, and one of the reasons you probably can't see it is because the blue line, the vintage 2020 on blended base is right on top of it. Um, so you can see there that the age and sex distribution basically matches DA. Um, the green line uh, in the back is the vintage 2020 estimates, so what we started with. And the red line is the 2020 census product that we released recently um, by age sex uh, for use for demographic analysis comparisons. Um, and it was a special tabulation that uh, we had a separate differential privacy uh, mechanism or run applied to. Um, so you can see there overall, they're really close to each other. Um, the 2020 census has a little bit of age heaping going on, um, but you can tell that the blue line, the vintage 2020 on blended base, um, matches pretty closely to demographic analysis and the 2020 census. And in places where it doesn't match, it's probably a little bit um, better. Specifically, uh, next slide. I want to call your attention to two age groups. So at the bottom, 
you can see that the red line, the 2020 census, um, seems to have some of the same uh, difficulties with coverage of young children uh, because the red line is in between or inside of the blue line, which means the census is showing less um, zero to four-year-olds than the blended base. Next slide. And here you can see the, the vintage 2020 estimates, the green line, had been carrying forward um, coverage errors from the zero to four-year-old population in 2010. And now the blended base has essentially corrected that and is right on top of both the 2020 census and the demographic analysis. Next slide. Okay, um, I think we are getting a little low on time. Um, so I'll go through this relatively quickly. Uh, plans for Vintage 2022, so what are we working on for this year specifically? Um, methodology improvements for the blended base, uh, using group quarters and household population totals from the 2020 census. Um, this last year we were only able to use resident population totals. Um, we also want to expand the use of demographic analysis age detail to 100 plus instead of, you know, 85 plus uh, to maximize its overall utility and to get our most bang for a buck, essentially. Um, we've also expanded the team um, and are currently training new developers and reviewers. So a small group of us did a large amount of the work on this, especially towards the end of last year. Um, and now that was sort of the innovation phase, and now we're much more in the stabilization, like it's, it's becoming a regular team and regular processes um, and starting on our cycle of constant improvement. Um, and we're also going to look to improve our review process. Um, we usually, we don't exactly measure twice, cut once. A lot of times we measure six times and cut once. So review is a really important thing for POP Division and the Census Bureau. Um, and we did really well. Uh, I think the team did really well with review last uh, year, but we want to standardize that and make it smoother so that it's, it's easier to do in the future. Uh, next slide. So potential future improvements or larger future improvements. Um, we have two sort of uh, parallel uh, research projects. Uh, one is estimates evaluation, which is it's a program that we do every decade where we compare the end point of the post census estimates, so in this case it would be finished 2020, against the current census. Um, and we look to see where did we maybe miss over time, like, and, and is it due to a particular component? So do we need to improve how we measure uh, births in Virginia or international migration to metro areas or, or whatever. Um, typically, we compare the estimates to the census, um, and the result of that is what's called an error of closure, or how bad are the estimates compared to the census. Um, this time, it's a little bit more complicated because we had the effects of the pandemic and differential privacy, so it's a little bit of a both ways. Um, we're using them to essentially uh, review the quality or evaluate the quality of both. Um, and then this decade, in addition to highlighting areas where we can improve our estimates of the components of change, we're also looking to see if it can inform enhancements that we could make to last decade's time series and thereby make the blended base better. So if we could have used a new, better method for international migration this decade, we can apply it to last decade and try to make the blended base better. Okay, next slide. The other main path for research and improvement right now is um, coverage measure results. So we talked about demographic analysis a lot. Um, in that case, usually when we compare demographic analysis to the census, errors are considered to be in the census and we use words like uh, under coverage and that type of thing. Um, now, as of now, by using demographic analysis, the blended base does make it better, make coverage um, concerns better for young children um, at the national level. But we are also looking into the feasibility of using other coverage measures uh, to 
account for differences uh, in the estimates and potentially to make the, the blended base and the estimates better. Um, there's a technical research team that was established in the population division who is currently in the process of, of scope setting and planning and organizing. Um, they haven't done, they haven't started in on a lot of the research yet, but it, we're, we're on the way. Um, and we plan to keep stakeholders updated regarding uh, all of this research process, timing, um, and potentially uh, in the future if we decide to make um, significant changes, we would also obviously do a federal register notice. Uh, next slide. Okay, so that's all the talking uh, that I have to do. So we have a few questions here for general NAC discussion, um, which we may have to do after the public questions. Um, you know, do you have any questions about why we needed the new approach for Vintage 2021 or the method that we use? Um, do you have recommendations for our ongoing research on the blended base? Uh, what other kinds of information could we give to you uh, to help you make better recommendations? Um, and what suggestions do you have on how we can more effectively communicate information on this topic? Um, and that's it. I guess, do we, Karen, are we going to switch over and do questions afterward? Thank you very much, Ben. I appreciate that. Um, your presentation was very good. And I know Eric Jensen is here to help answer questions. So thank you both. Um, now I think is a good time for us to get prepared for the public comment period. And so, operator, uh, I would like to ask if you could please provide instructions uh, to folks who may want to dial in and give a verbal public comment. Yes, if you would like to provide a public comment, please press star one on your phone. Make sure it's unmuted and record your name and affiliation. Again, that is star one on your phone, and it'll be a moment for questions to come in or comments to come in. Thank you. Okay. Well, while people are getting into the queue, there's a little bit of information I want to share. It's just that during this virtual meeting, we, of course, are going to take public comments verbally. Uh, comments are limited, limited to two minutes. Anything over that may be submitted in written form. Uh, before you begin verbal comments, please state your name followed by affiliation and then your comment. Uh, we actually received six written public comments, which are now posted on the NAC meeting page on census.gov. And the Federal Register Notice located on the NAC website provides more information on submission of written comments. And so while we're waiting for people to get into the queue, I will actually go through uh, the six written public comments. The first comment comes from Deborah Weinstein, who is the Executive Director of Coalition on Human Needs. She says, I am submitting these comments on behalf of the Coalition on Human Needs, an independent alliance of human service provider groups, faith organizations, policy experts, labor, civil rights, and other advocacy organizations concerned with meeting the needs of people with low income. Children and people of color are among those disproportionately poor, and so their needs are a particular focus of our members. We are very concerned about the emerging evidence that the 2020 census net undercount of young children is worse than in previous decades, with suggested findings that the net undercount of young children of color is even worse. Therefore, we strongly support the Bureau's creation of a cross-directorate team on the undercount of young children as a very constructive step. We encourage the cross-directorate team to assess the factors that most correlate with high levels of missed young children by creating a research plan to gauge sub-state areas where children were most likely to be missed and to identify reasons why children of color were missed. We urge the team to review ideas from the 2020 Census Task Force on the young child undercount to identify means of improving the count that were not implemented in 2020, but that could improve outcomes in 2030. 
The cross-directorate team should consider such operational measures as more extensive mailings to targeted communities and development of procedures to ensure that enumerators have access to apartment complexes. It is of particular importance that the cross-directorate team evaluate the use of administrative records to improve the accuracy of the count of young children for 2020 and to assess whether the use of such records will improve accuracy for Hispanic and black children as well as white children. Because the undercount of young children and of Hispanic and black populations appears to be extremely high, we urge the Census Bureau to undertake research into why the response rate in predominantly Hispanic and black tracts declined in 2020 and to release data about variations in coverage error by race and ethnicity either for analysis by outside researchers or if that does not comply with privacy requirements, do the analysis in-house. And I invite you all to please read the remainder of that public comment, which is posted on our public website. The next comment comes from the National Urban League. The U.S. Census Bureau's recent announcement delaying the release date for the next set of 2020 census data products uh, including the demographic profile and the demographic and housing characteristics file to May 2023. A full three years after the 2020 census is troubling on several fronts. While we applaud the Census Bureau's plan to release an unprecedented amount of detailed information on diverse population groups, data quality concerns are heightened given the lengthy delay in releasing this data. Specifically, the prolonged time frame in which government leaders and policymakers must rely on old data for decision making and resource allocation raises questions about fairness and equity. Populations that have been counted well in the previous census may fare better than those who were not with respect to those resources and allocations. Decision makers do not have an accurate profile of their communities and won't know for an additional year how their communities have changed between 2010 and 2020. The extensive delay in publishing detailed 2020 demographic and housing characteristics hurts federal programs, researchers, and policymakers' ability to make timely assessments of health disparities among groups and assess other federal, state, local, and tribal program needs. In addition, what are the implications, if any, for Census Bureau staff who must rely on dated information from 2010 to develop frames and modeling for other census surveys conducted this year. Are these data good enough for the Census Bureau's own survey and methodological needs until the data are released next year or later? Detailed demographic and housing characteristics data will now be released as three separate products, with the first product scheduled for release in August 2023, and the schedule for the remaining products still are being determined. And I invite everyone to read the remainder of that public comment that is posted on our website. The next public comment comes from Deborah Stein, Network Director with the Partnership for America's Children. The Partnership for America's Children submits these comments to the National Advisory Committee or the Census Bureau for its May 2022 meeting. The partnership's mission is to support its network of state and community multi-issue child advocacy organizations in effective advocacy. The partnership has 49 member organizations in 40 states that advocate to improve policy for children at the state, local, and federal level. Collectively, they represent over 90% of the nation's children. Partnership members use census data in their advocacy, and 30 partnership members are also Kid Count grantees in their state, serving as that state's data hub on children for policymakers, administrators, and nonprofits. The Partnership for America's Children served as the national hub on the undercount of young children in the 2020 decennial census. In this role, the partnership formed and continues to co-lead a national working group on child-serving organizations that is working to improve the count of young children in all Census Bureau demographic products. Based on the planned agenda, we make the following recommendations. It would be much appreciated if the Bureau could produce the slides for the NAC meetings a few days in advance so that we can provide more helpful comments. Number one, we are very pleased 
that the Bureau has created a cross-directed team on the undercount of young children. We suggest the team should include in its work the following activities and include a focus on the undercount of young Hispanic and black children who are missed at more than double the rate of white children. For that purpose, we suggest that they include stakeholders from these communities. A, reviewing ideas and recommendations from the 2020 Census Task Force on the Young Child Undercount to see which ideas could not be implemented in 2020 for lack of time, but might be included in 2030 planning. B, assessing the effectiveness of the mailing to communities at high risk of missing young children in 2020. C, accessing other efforts to count young children. And I invite the public to read the rest of that public comment, uh, which is posted on our website. Public comment number four comes from Michelle Dallafior, the Senior Vice President of Budget and Tax, with First Focus on Children. First Focus on Children, a national children's advocacy group dedicated to making children and families a priority in federal budget and policy decisions, thanks you for the opportunity to submit the following comments for the 2022 Spring National Advisory Committee meeting. As an organization committed to ensuring that all kids in the United States have equal opportunity to thrive and a co-lead of the Count All Kids Committee, we remain very concerned about the potential detrimental implications of the undercount of children in the 2020 census on federal spending on children over the next decade. The recent release of the demographic analysis data shows that the net undercount of young children in 2020 was even larger than in 2010. And some initial analysis from Dr. Bill O'Hare finds that the proportion of black and Hispanic children missed in 2020 will be worse than 2010. First focus on children convenes the Children's Budget Coalition, which is made up of over 80 national children's advocacy organizations with priorities across a diverse range of issues, such as health, education, nutrition, the child welfare system, early childhood learning, safe housing, and more. The coalition's work capitalizes on members' broad policy expertise to collectively advocate for children to receive their fair share of federal investments as well as serve as a resource for policymakers, stakeholders, and other advocates. First Focus on Children also issues an annual children's budget book, which tracks and analyzes domestic and international spending on children in the federal budget. Through this work, we know that the federal government continues to underinvest in our nation's children and families, which has resulted in the United States ranking near the bottom of dozens of advanced nations in terms of the well-being of its children with higher rates of child poverty, higher infant mortality rates, and children suffering greater inequality in access to educational resources than our wealthy peer nations. And I invite you all to read the remainder of that public comment that is posted on our website. The next public comment comes from Victor Sin, who is with the Civic Engagement Team at the Asian Law Alliance. The Asian Law Alliance is a nonprofit that provides legal services in Santa Clara County with a particular focus on our AAPI and low-income populations. We worked extensively on census outreach in 2020. Working with partner organizations, we were able to push AAPI groups in Santa Clara County for a high response rate. When we look at various ethnic groups within the AAPI community, we see different educational outcomes, socioeconomic outcomes, living situations, access to health care, mental health services, et cetera. Disaggregated census data will help us identify the needs of the different ethnic groups and enable us to serve them better. We need the data sooner rather than later. We encourage the U.S. Census Bureau to release disaggregated census data no later than April 1st 2023. The last written public comment comes from Arpita Joyce. High quality national origin data on AAPIs is necessary to better understand the challenges faced by our student populations and to better serve and support their varied educational needs. AAPI communities have different migration histories and contributions 
it is important to center and uplift our most vulnerable and marginalized community members, particularly Cambodian, Laotian, uh, Native Hawaiian, and Samoan communities. High quality, detailed data is essential to understanding student challenges in all communities and is vital to securing public and private resources to help students in need. I urge the Census Bureau to release disaggregated population counts on the basis of sex and gender no later than April 1st, 2023. As a community organizer, disaggregated data is essential to addressing the health, educational, and housing needs of the AAPI community, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic and in the midst of xenophobic, Islamophobic, and xenophobic violence. I also request that you will provide more clarity through providing a timeline for the release of other disaggregated data, such as household type and size. Okay, so that concludes all of the written public comments that we have. Uh, operator, do we have um, anyone in queue? We do not have anyone in queue at this time. Thank you. Okay. And on that point, then I believe we will resume our discussion. Okay, so I believe we will now are ready to hear from our discussant, Andrea. This is Shauna Banks. Karen, can you just officially close the public comment period, please? Yes, I am officially closing the public comment period. Thank you, Shauna. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrea Centino. I am the I am uh, with the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund and Organizational uh, NAC member. Um, I want to thank the presenters today uh, for um, all of the information that you've provided about blended base for the population estimates. It's very helpful uh, to us. Um, you know, we recognize the importance of the population estimates for all of the reasons that you um, noted in your presentation, how critical it is for federal funding, um, how important it is as a component for many other uh, census data products that we all use in our work every day um, and that the public relies on. Um, for many different reasons. So thank you for that information and explaining why you all have decided to go to a blended base, um, at least for, you know, the um, 2021 vintage estimates. So I wanted to uh, answer, and can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, you've posed a number of questions for NAC discussion, and I will go through and provide my initial thoughts um, to all of those questions that you um, have raised for us. The first one being, do you have any questions about why we needed a new approach for producing the vintage 2021 population estimates or how we implemented the blended base? Next slide, please. So first, I want to address um, an important question that we have, which is why is using un unprotected census 2020 as a base for estimates a violation of Title 13? Um, you mentioned that it's a benefit uh, that you are using um, the um, uh, data after uh, differential privacy um, protections have been applied. Uh, we want to better understand why it's a violation to use the unprotected data and to the extent that that response um, is because there in, you know, is the potential for reverse engineering. Um, we want to like to understand whether, um, you know, the Census Bureau has simulated uh, reverse engineering as it considered the options here, how difficult is reverse engineering um, that data um, to discover unprotected household data. Um, how did the Census Bureau come up with blended, the blended place process and what input, if any, did the Census Bureau solicit from interested stakeholders? Um, next slide, please. We also wondered, uh, or I also wondered, can you explain in greater detail how the use of a blended base uh, estimate distortions, estimates distortions from differential privacy and errors from the 2020 decennial census and the vintage 2021 population estimates, um, and for which, for whom and for which groups? And with respect to the data availability from the 2020 census, do you now have all of the necessary data available 
um, that would be necessary for future population estimates for the decade. I know that you have mentioned that there is still a lag in uh, the data for the 2020 decennial census numbers, um, and it appears that, you know, we'd like more information about uh, the timing of that lag and what that really means for future population estimate products. Um, in addition to that, does the use of differential privacy make the future use of 2020 decennial, decennial census, excuse me, a potential challenge for future population estimates? So how does differential privacy um, being incorporated into the data um, impact uh, its potential future use as a base? Next slide, please. The question that you have posed is whether we have any recommendations for ongoing research on blended place, blended base. Next slide, please. So some topics or some issues that we think would be very helpful for your research um, would be, you know, what are the populations that might be helped or hurt by the use of blended base? You specifically noted young children um, and how um, the use of blended base corrected uh, some of the inaccuracies or the undercounts that we saw in 2020 and likely will, uh, and have seen in 2020. Um, and so, for example, does the use of blended base help to mitigate the undercount of Latinos or Hispanics from the 2020 decennial census, which is a huge issue for Maldives? Um, and there are undercounts of other populations as well. Um, and is there, or is there a possibility that blended base could exacerbate undercounts in some way? Um, and so better understanding um, who may be helped or hurt by the use of blended base. What are the implications of having inconsistent total count, total population counts for cities, counties, towns, and sub-county places between the 2020 decennial census totals and the total population estimates? Uh, what, if any, effects will blended base have on race and ethnicity data in the population estimate? And how is the Census Bureau planning to test or research that effect? Next slide, please. Other questions for research. Uh, what is the effect on ACS and CPS data accuracy as a result of the use of blended base um, as compared to when the population estimates um, use the used at the decennial census as its base. Are there other potential data sources that could be utilized that would help to address the ongoing biases and undercounts for race and ethnic groups? Um, and are uh, population estimates, how are population estimates, specifically the blended base, affected by potential errors in race and ethnicity data from birth certificates or potentially from other uh, data sources that are going into um, the base? through demographic analysis or through, um, you know, the vintage data you're already using for 2020. Uh, next slide, please. You asked what additional information would be helpful for NAC members to make recommendations on this topic. Next slide, please. And obviously my colleagues may have other recommendations as well about what would be helpful information, but some initial thoughts. Um, it would be helpful to know, is the Census Bureau internally going to track its estimates against uh, estimates based on unprotected Census 2020 data? Uh, where is the Census Bureau in making a determination about the suitability of the 2020 Census to serve as a base for future population estimates? I, we heard today that uh, you are still in the process of making that determination, having some better sense of what is the timeline there and what is the Bureau looking for in order to make that type of final determination. So not just the timing, but what is the process for making that kind of an assessment? What are you looking for in the data for suitability? Um, what is the Census Bureau's timeline for research and methodology for future vintage population estimates? Uh, next slide, please. What's the timeline for the E2 findings this year? Um, what is the timeline for receiving additional data to use in the vintage 2022 estimates? Um, what are the different data sources that are being considered uh, if you are considering them now for the vintage 2022 estimates? Um, and what opportunities will there be for public input on this topic outside of the NAC and CSAC, but obviously also wanting to understand what future opportunities there will be for the NAC to also participate in this process. And then next slide, please. 
And then lastly, you asked, are there suggestions from NAC members on how we can be more effectively communicating information on blended base? Um, next slide. Um, so it would be helpful to provide data users and the public with plain language explanations of the data sources that are used to create to create the blended base. Um, you know, this is a can be very technical, um, and there are a lot of uh, records and there are a lot of um, data sources from which you are um, pulling information to create the blended base. And those who are less versed in um, in those uh, data products may not really understand where all of that information is coming from and the implications of using those different data sets. So providing um, some greater plain language explanations would be very helpful. Um, and providing a clear communication regarding the proper usage of population estimate data products and how, if at all, that usage might be affected by blended base. Um, there tends to be a, a continuing conversation about uh, what this different data products are intended to be used for and what their limitations are. And so better understanding or better communicating what those limitations of population estimates might be, um, knowing that they are used for very specific things um, and, and they're very critical, but what are the limitations to that data usage and how might that limitation be affected by blended base, knowing that people may be using the data for other things. And I believe that is my last slide. Um, and you can go to the next slide, um, which is just comments and opening up the discussion and looking forward to your responses. Thank you. I don't see any um, questions or comments in the queue for many NAC members at this time. NAC members, please submit any questions or comments that you might have. It, while, while we're waiting, can I take a second to kind of respond to the um, to her questions? Please. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of questions, uh, but I, I noticed a few sort of like threads throughout, and I'll try to um, I'll try to address them. Um, I think uh, specifically, I want to address one of the first things you asked, one of the last things you asked, and then I'll talk about the threads. Uh, so the reason that we can't use unprotected um, decennial data as a basis for the population estimates is because differential privacy presents a mathematical guarantee. So in that case, it's, it's abstract and it's, a, it's an all or nothing kind of thing. So if you touch the data to make anything without protecting the data first, then the whole guarantee falls apart. So it's not, because uh, we, we had a number of discussions early on when people were still getting their bearing on this. Um, you would think that, like colloquially, uh, if you took the unprotected data and then just use it as a basis and did a whole bunch of things to it and added migration and births and all that, like nobody's going to be able to back it out. Um, and the possibility of that is, yeah, in a lot of ways, nobody's probably going to be able to back it out. But what differential privacy does is it gives you a mathematical probability of almost a, a guarantee that you can't back it out or that you can only back it out with uh, some certain degree of probability. Um, and actually using the unprotected data in any way makes that an invalid statement. Um, and the last question that you had, or one of the last questions, was the limitations of the population estimates. Um, the population estimates that were created using the blended base are totally valid for all of the myriad of uses of the population estimates that we normally make are. Um, it's, it's just as valid as the Vintage 2020 estimates or something from the middle of the last decade. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's just improved over all of those because not only does it now uh, agree with census totals, um, so it's been like the totals have been pulled in line with current data, but it also has improvements from the age and sex distribution from DA that we've talked about. Um, so all of the top estimates uses should be just as valid as they were a year ago, and they're probably better for it right now. Um, now to address the, the different threads very quickly. Um, 
the first one that I noticed was about uh, the quality of the blended base, the accuracy of the blended base versus the decennial census. You know, like what if we use 2020 instead? Um, number one, we don't have an answer to that yet because we don't have decennial census data to compare it to because we, we're still waiting for um, the differentially private characteristics data to be available even to us. Um, and two, it, because of that, it's not really what's better or worse between those two isn't really the right framing, I don't think. Um, the question is more because we didn't have the Seniel data, our options were really between just continuing the 2010 based time series that we've been doing, not adjusting for census or DA, or using the blended base that is adjusted for census and DA. And we feel that the second option is is better. So it's better to adjust for census and DA. Um, but there's no way to really, we can't really compare the blended base with the decennial census um, because that data is just not available yet. Um, and later when we do get the characteristics data, we should be able to um, uh, do that analysis, uh, then we'll be able to say, like, which one's better. Um, in terms of, you had several points about outreach. Um, so prior to implementing the blended base, uh, our primary contacts were with the Federal State Cooperative for Population Estimates. So that's a uh, group that we have, that we interact with very regularly. Um, it's made up of typically um, the chief demographer of each state that's appointed by the governor. Um, and we have a lot of methodological discussions with them and we debate like what's the best way to do things. Um, but we also had outreach with several other groups. Uh, I can't remember the names right off the top of my head, but we did have a meeting with a group on the coverage of young children. Um, and they were, they were pretty positive about the idea that we were gonna be able to use um, demographic analysis data to help with the coverage of young children. Um, as a matter of fact, from that discussion, uh, we were initially thinking about using census voting age as a control, um, but we decided to just use all of the single years of age as a control, and I, I think that that helped make a much better distribution. So um, we definitely incorporated some of the feedback that we got. And for the future, um, you know, we're going to continue to do uh, outreach. There might be a federal register notice or two. Um, we have a hopefully fairly plain language um, discussion of the blended base in the this year's methodology statement. So we put out a methodology statement every year with the estimate. Um, and also, I think my colleagues have wrote at least three blogs um, talking about different aspects of it, uh, which you can find on the bureau website. So. I, I, we're, we're trying to get it out there in plain language, and I agree with you that transparency, especially on something like this, is extremely vital. Um, you had a few questions about using additional sources. Um, some things like the birth certificates, that's whatever issues were in the vintage 2020 population estimates due to components of change, like they're still there um, because we didn't, we, we took the Vintage 2020 as the best estimate of characteristics that we had at the time. Um, we have done a survey into other administrative record sources. Um, we're talking about reaching out to the folks that work on the Dem, uh, Demographic Frames project. Um, we had a discussion about E2 and uh, coverage adjustments. Um, so. The question is ongoing. Um, we tried a few things when we were initially developing. Like I know uh, I tried to use Social Security age data to see if I could improve the age detail distributions for counties. That didn't work out very well. But like we're open to ideas and we're investigating them uh, presently. Um, there's a couple questions about evaluation. Yes, E2, I believe, uh, and. Eric might be able to provide more details. Um, E2 is going to compare the estimates to unprotected census data, at least internally. Um, I believe they're already sharing results. Uh, the plan this 
this decade is to do it on a rolling basis, so as available. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, I think that covered the general idea. Was there any specific questions uh, that either you had or looks like? Um... She, Angela, I have a follow-up question. I did have one follow-up question based on the, so thank you for all of that. That's very helpful. We obviously, um, you know, look forward to an ongoing discussion uh, about uh, blended base um, with you all and looking to be a partner on that. I do want to go back to um, one of the responses that you gave specifically to my first question about the unprotected data, just to be under, under just so I understood it because it was differential privacy and how it's applied um, can be very um, uh, detailed, uh, and sometimes, don't, you know, I just want to make sure that sure. I understood what your response really meant. So if I sure. repeat back to you what I understood you to be saying, which may be correct or incorrect, um, it was that if to, to use unprotected data as the base for the population estimates here undermines the use, undermines the use of differential privacy in the sense that, um, you are putting out a data product that um, no longer has the um, guarantee, as you put it, of being unable to reverse engineer a data product to identify individual households. And so therefore, all the data products must now adhere to the disclosure avoidance system that you have, which requires the application of differential privacy before putting out a data product that is not the invariant state total. So if I'm understanding that correctly, okay, if I'm understanding that correctly then, it's not that the Census Bureau has researched and tried to determine how difficult it is to reverse engineer and you have not, uh, try to reverse engineer data, but on a theoretical level, uh, you can't do it. So, on a theoretical uh, level, there's a policy decision not to do it. Right. Um, if there was a policy decision that everything that touches the decennial census needs to be different by private. Um, there were evaluations, like re-identification uh, studies done on the decennial data from 2010. Uh, I don't know that anybody's done this kind of thing for the estimate. Um, and it'd be especially hard to back out estimates because the estimates also contain um, uh, information for like domestic migration comes primarily from uh, IRS tax returns and Medicare enrollment and that's not publicly available. Um, so it's, it's more the principle of the thing. Like we can't, we, we have to keep all of the hatches closed to keep it protected from uh, to keep the protections in, in place, I guess. But yeah, I think you have the general idea. Okay, thank you, and sorry for my messy explanation to get there. Oh, no. No, no, no worries. We'll close up the discussion at this time, and I'll turn it back over to you, Carol, uh, excuse me, Karen, for the next presentation. Hello. Okay. Can you hear me? Oh. Director Santos has a comment. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Oh. I wanted to interrupt, I'm sorry. Since, since I, I, uh, you guys report to me, I, I feel I have the opportunity to, to jump in. And uh, I wanted to, to actually uh, ask a, a question to Ben. And uh, with regard, because I was listening very carefully and I think this was a really great discussion uh, with regard to the determination to use differential privacy as a policy um, matter. And what I wanted to know, is it a matter of zero versus non-zero in terms of the probability of identification? And so that the only reason for implementing differential privacy was to retain the true zero as opposed to some other value that's non-zero and could go anywhere from you know, a quadrillion to 0.9? Uh, so I am not, uh, I'll, I'll preface by saying my background is not in a math degree and I'm not the world's leading expert okay. on that, that's fine. Um, okay. different okay. privacy. Yeah. But, but mm -hmm. no, there is no way to prevent all possibility of re-identification. 
the thing that differential privacy does the way that I understand it mm -hmm. um, is that it allows you to put a probability on the likelihood of being identified. So you can make a statement to the public about if you participate in our survey, it increases your risk by X um, over not participating. Like someone could still figure out that you didn't participate and figure out things about you, but participating only increases your risk by some amount. And the whole point of all of the differential privacy math magic is to make it so that that proportion can be a known thing. And if you use unprotected data in any sort of um, publication, then that probability means nothing because now, like, something came out that wasn't wasn't covered by that at all. So the probability goes from whatever it is to infinity. Well, yeah, to one. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> I, yeah, I totally get uh, I get it. So uh, thank you. That's really informative, and we can have additional conversations. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that there are other that. folks that can explain it uh, even better. <laughs> so thank, thank you. Very much. And, and you did a great job. I, so thank you. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much, uh, Ben Bolander and Eric Jensen, and thank you, Andrea uh, Dantino, for uh, that great discussion and uh, presentation. So now I believe we are ready to move on to our final presenter for the day, Keith Finley, who will present the Criminal Justice Administrative Records uh, topic, followed by discussant John Sandoval and the committee discussion. Hi, good afternoon. I'm really excited to uh, talk to the committee about the Criminal Justice Administrative Records System, or CJARS. My name is Keith Finlay. I am an economist in the business development staff the Economic Reimbursable Surveys Division, and I would just uh, point you to the uh, disclosure that's at the bottom of the slide. Next slide, please. So the Criminal Justice Administrative Record System is a data infrastructure project to support the next generation of statistics and research on the criminal justice system. It's a partnership between the Census Bureau and the University of Michigan, started in 2016. We have a great team at the University of Michigan that collects and harmonizes state and local criminal justice data once those data have been transferred to securely to the Census Bureau, they can be linked with the wealth of survey and administrative records uh, to produce information products about the criminal justice system and the population that interacts with it. Next slide, please. Before talking about the project in more detail, I'd like to talk about some research findings, as these are really the, the motivation for why we started the project in the first place. Next slide. So as part of building data infrastructure, we use research to improve the quality of our data. As the project matures, most CJAR's research will be produced by external researchers. We're really excited about that future. Today, I'd like to talk to you about felony conviction risk, children living with justice-involved adults, mortality risk, and employment and self-employment rates. Next slide. So, felony conviction risk. What proportion of people in a cohort have been convicted of a felony by age 25. This is a really fundamental measure of the scope of the criminal justice system, but it's almost impossible to measure this at the population level without some measure of a cohort. So here we're gonna use the census numinant to identify place of birth and year of birth. We need longitudinal court disposition data, which we're gonna get from CJARS, and we need high quality demographic ident identifiers that we collect from Title 13 race and ethnicity files, including decennial censuses. Next slide, please. So this slide shows distributional characteristics uh, by demographic group for these cohort felony conviction risks, where a cohort is defined by a year of birth, a commuting zone or metropolitan area of birth, sex, and race and ethnicity. So the values here are, are the values for uh, the percent of people in a cohort convicted of a felony by age 25. And so if you look at the top row, you can see for black men, the, the median cohort has a felony conviction risk that's above 20%. And if you go over to the extreme at the 90th percentile, there is a cohort of black men that has a 27% uh, uh, likelihood of, of having a felony conviction by age 25. We can measure at the, at the population level, even for demographic groups with smaller populations like uh, American Indian and Alaska Native men, 
And you can see there that there's, there's quite a bit of uh, uh, range in the, the distribution and overlaps quite a lot with, with the, the distribution of covert uh, felony conviction risk for black men. We can also measure this for women. Um, and you can see just in general, people, people of color have uh, higher, higher impact, uh, sorry, higher exposure to the criminal justice system through felony conviction. Next slide, please. Next, uh, looking at how children are affected by the justice system. So the question here is what proportion of children born between 1999 and 2005 have lived with a justice-involved adult? There's been a significant increase in the adult population that interacts with the criminal justice system. But how many children are connected to those individuals through, uh, through living with them? So we could look at biological parents, which we can identify in administrative records. But we might also want to look at other co-resident adults because of the diversity of uh, child living experiences. We also want to look at how this impact varies by race and ethnicity. To measure these statistics, we're going to link CJARs to family and residential history crosswalks that we synthesize from a variety of administrative and survey records. Next slide, please. So this figure shows the percent of children who have lived with a justice-involved biological parent or co-resident adult by age 18. It's a cumulative measure of uh, that experience through childhood. And we're identifying this uh, given four criminal justice events, any criminal charge that's a felony or a misdemeanor, a felony charge, a felony conviction, or imprisonment during the childhood. And you can see that for biological, for children, uh, their biological, sorry, 28% of children have a biological parent that's had a criminal charge by the time they're age 18. We expand that out to co-resident adults. Um, we get to almost 40%. Looking at the other extreme, you can see that about 4% of children have had a biological parent in prison during the childhood, and about 9% have had a co-resident adult in prison during the childhood. Next slide, please. When we break this down by race and ethnicity, we see there's a very disparate impact of the criminal justice system on children through uh, their residency with uh, uh, justice-involved adults. In particular, Black, Hispanic, and American Indian Alaska Native children are at much higher risk. Again, this is the percent of children with justice-involved co-resident adults by age 18. And here, uh, blue is any criminal charge. And then going down to the right, uh, the reddish color is incarceration of one of those adults. And here you can see if we look at black and non-Hispanic children, uh, the, the likelihood of uh, a criminal charge of a co-resident adult is above 60%. For American Indian Alaska Native children, uh, the number is about the same, around 60%. If we look at incarceration, you can see that about 20% of uh, black non-Hispanic children have had a co-resident adult incarcerated by age 18. And we also see similarly high uh, 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 estimates for Hispanics. Next slide, please. Next, we're going to look at mortality risk of justice caseloads. So what are the mortality rates of people convicted of felonies or released from prison? We know this is a high-risk population in a number of ways. And if we measure higher mortality rates, it affects how we interpret uh, measures of other outcomes like employment. Here we're going to link CJARs with the census numerant to identify date of death. Next slide, please. So these are measures of cumulative mortality uh, since about 2010. There's three groups here. There's a prison release group that was released around 2010, a felony conviction group released around the same time. And then I have a, comp uh, a reference uh, cohort of men who are age 30 in 2010. These come from the Social Security Administration. That's the light blue. And what you can see with the two justice-involved cohorts is that the mortality, uh, the cumulative mortality rates are significantly higher over this 12-year period than they are for the general population. Uh, at, towards the end, uh, the difference is it, they're about four times as likely to have died during that period. Next slide, please. Finally, we're going to talk about the employment of justice-involved people. So what proportion of people convicted of felonies or released from prison are employed? We know that employment is a critical element of reentry into society. Here, we're going to link CJARs with IRS W-2 information returns to identify employer-based employment. We're also going to plot a reference group from similarly aged ACS respondents who have not completed high school and are not in CJARs. It's a relatively low skill group that doesn't seem to have criminal records in the states where we're going to uh, make these calculations. Next slide, please. So this is the employment of people who had felony convictions between 2006 and 2010. They have these different markers where you can see where the event occurred. Um, the, the gray box is the Great Recession, so there's a decline in labor market opportunities during that period. And the black line 
are the same sort of outcomes, but for that ACS reference cohort of people who did not complete high school but did not have criminal records. First thing is you can see a big gap between these two groups and the justice involved people have uh, much lower employment outcomes, even though our reference group is already low skilled. You can see that the Great Recession caused even steeper declines in employment uh, during the recession period. And you can see that it's hard for this group to catch up uh, to the reference group over time. There's some catch up, but um, they're not closing that gap after a 12 year period. Next slide. Uh, this is a similar figure for prison exit. I'm going to skip over it because I want to make sure that we have time for discussion. So next slide, please. And then finally, I'm going to show you uh, information about self-employment. So what proportion of the justice involved population are self-employed? Um, we just saw that people with criminal records have difficulty finding work. And there's growing evidence that they use self-employment as an alternative to employer-based jobs. So we're going to link C jars with IRS Form 1040 data to identify who files a Schedule C, which is used for reporting uh, self-employment earnings. Next slide, please. So this is a plot of the proportion that were self-employed using that Schedule C measure between 2014 and 2018. Just at least once they were self-employed. Uh, next slide, please. The uh, Tan uh, figures are for Form 1040 filers without criminal records, and the blue uh, um, uh, markers are for Form 1040 filers with criminal records. Next slide, please. If we look at the overall population of men and women, you can see that people with criminal records have higher rates of self-employment than, uh, than the rest of the group. Next slide, please. The most striking difference here is for uh, women of color, and see for uh, black women, uh, more than 40% of them are self-employed during this period, and it's a significantly higher rate of self-employment than for the rest of the population. Next slide, please. We also see these uh, differentials, pretty significant differentials for, um, uh, for younger people, especially for younger women. Next slide, please. So to wrap up, so CGARS enables really transformational measurement. Uh, these are statistics that we wouldn't have been able to calculate without CJARs linked in with the other kinds of survey and administrative data that we have in the data linkage infrastructure at the Census Bureau, seeing that there's higher rates of felony conviction, large percentage of children who have lived with justice-involved adults, higher relative contact with Black, Hispanic, and American Indian, Alaska Native adults and children. The justice-involved have higher mortality rates than the general population, and the justice-involved have lower employer-based employment but higher rates of self-employment than comparison groups. Next slide, please. Uh, so now I'm going to give you a little bit more overview of uh, the project and how it works. Next slide, please. So the motivation for the project is that the U.S. really has incomplete criminal justice data infrastructure that reflects the decentralized nature of our criminal justice system. This data infrastructure limits how performance is measured and which policy questions are asked, leads to varying definitions of recidivism, makes it difficult to identify effective policy levers, and prevents comprehensive benefit cost analyses that take into account other outcomes besides criminal justice ones. Next slide, please. So the goals of the CJARS project are to collect, harmonize, and link longitudinal, multi-jurisdictional criminal justice data to track individuals and cases across space and time, to enable timely and innovative federal statistical products about the criminal justice system and the justice-involved population, and to provide a national research platform for qualified researchers on approved projects. Next slide, please. CJARS has a number of important stakeholders. At the University of Michigan, the team acquires and harmonizes data from criminal justice agencies, including law enforcement, judicial, and corrections agencies. The Census Bureau links CJARS with other socioeconomic data to build data products for data providers, develop new data products, and improve operations. Qualified researchers on approved projects analyze and anonymize CJARS data in the Federal Statistical Research Data Centers, and communities and policymakers use CJARS derived statistical products to understand the performance of the criminal justice system. Next slide, please. We're proud of our accomplishments so far. We've proven we can acquire and harmonize state and local criminal justice data. We've transferred multiple well-documented vintages to census. Last year, we hosted launch webinars with more than 1,100 registrants. We've established an, offense, an enhanced offense classification standard, produced statistics never before possible, and recently launched outreach on census.gov. Next slide, please. 
This is a summary of our uh, data coverage in the CDARS data set so far. Collected data from more than 300 data providers that represent more than 1,000 counties. This map on the right is a summary of states where we have statewide coverage of state court systems, state departments of corrections, or state criminal records repositories. That's the lighter blue and the darker blue. Darker blue are states where we have more than one of those domains. The blue states represent more than half of the U.S. population. Purple states are where we have data on uh, caseload snapshots, for example, a number of prisoners on a particular date, but not longitudinal data. And green states are where we have uh, uh, data from a significant number of counties, but we don't have statewide um, criminal justice data yet. We have two billion records collected so far that represent 175 million criminal justice events linked to 36 million unique individuals. Next slide, please. I want to give some sense of the ambition of the project by talking about project scope and data collection. We're collecting data on arrest, pretrial detention, adjudication, or court processing, probation, incarceration, and parole. Next slide, please. We get these data from police departments. Slide. Sheriff's offices and jails. Slide. Prosecutor's offices. Slide. State court administrators and criminal courts, slide. Departments of Correction, slide. Community Corrections Agencies, slide. And Criminal History Records Repositories, slide. Most of the data currently come from the blue, uh, the blue agencies, so state court administrators, state departments of correction, and state criminal records repositories, slide. There's also a number of areas that we consider out of scope because we try to keep uh, a limit on uh, um, uh, what we're trying to collect and have it be relatively well-defined and restricted to our kind of areas of interest. And I'm not gonna go over each one of these just to, to save a little bit of time. Um, and I, I think there's some in the discussion, we'll get to some of it a little. Okay, next slide, please. Finally, I'm gonna wrap up by talking about growing the project. Slide. So it's important to us to expand CJAR's data coverage. Um, the goal is to get a national data product. Uh, a representative data system requires significantly more data acquisition. And we're working hard to induce greater criminal justice agency participation. We've been working on automated agency statistical products that provide val value back to our agency data providers. Um, we're trying to enable criminal justice agency research through the Federal Statistical Research Data Centers. And we'd like to encourage stakeholders to encourage agencies to provide data to the project. Next slide, please. An important application of the CJARS data at the Census Bureau is to potentially use CJARS data in group quarters oper uh, operations. How could CJARS microdata be used to support group quarters tests, validations, and enumeration? The data that we get from agencies uh, about location generally is not in the form that group quarters might collect it. It's in this data called uh, movement tables. So it shows like where a person entered a facility and, and on what date they might have exited the facility. And we started collecting some of that information and we're working on parsing it to see how we could reproduce uh, uh, the rosters that a group quarters operation might collect um, during a survey operation. We're also trying to assess race and ethnicity concordance between the raw administrative data that might not be self-reported and the self-reported data that we see in decennial data. We're working to increase prison and jail data acquisition. A related project <clears throat> involves the integration of uh, Department of Justice criminal justice facility frames at the Census Bureau into group quarters operations. And those frames might provide uh, identifiers that could be used in CJARS data to uh, denote uh, in which facility an, an individual is on a particular date. Next slide, please. So a couple questions for the committee. Like I said, a representative data system requires significantly more data acquisition. How does the committee suggest we increase data acquisition? And then justice-involved populations often have other disadvantages that may impact the acronyms in the major. So uh, someone who has spent time in prison may uh, not uh, have, may have low employment outcomes, not just because they have that criminal record, but also because they haven't had a lot of job experience by the time they try to look for a job. So how does the committee suggest we contextualize statistics about the justice-involved population? to make them relevant for the public that might consume them through the Census Bureau website. Next slide, please. So thank you. This is the, uh, the link for the, the project on the Census site, and there you can get to the project website on the University of Michigan site. And I'll also say, I believe my collaborator at the University of Michigan, uh, Mike Miller-Smith, 
might be available on the line um, if people have questions for operations that happen at, at the University of Michigan. So thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much, Keith. And um, Cherokee and I uh, would like to keep going and uh, hear from the discussant now and have committee discussion, and we will uh, delay the break. All right, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Battle, do you have a time target for me to uh, wrap up this presentation? I have 10 slides. Uh, well, I would say walk through your slides, John. Okay, yeah, hopefully we can we can wrap up um, shortly, but just walk through your slides. Sure. So first off, I want to thank the, the presenter, Keith, as well as staff at uh, C. George University of Michigan to uh, really help me uh, through conversations, as well as Antonio Ellis for facilitating these meetings and conversations. They were instrumental in uh, building my knowledge on an important area, uh, topic area that I had uh, never heard of and had zero knowledge of just this time last week, so much appreciation there. Uh, next slide, please. So really, uh, I want to take a step back and examine what we have here. It really is it's a public-public partnership that's funded largely by grants. So obviously the partners here are the United States Census Bureau as well as the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. And this started in 2016 with funding from uh, Arnold Ventures, really for the pilot, to see, is it even possible to construct this kind of data set and infrastructure? And then in later years, follow on from uh, John and Melinda Gates Foundation, National Science Foundation, and other funders. Next slide, please. I think there are a number of uh, positive, good things about this that I'd like to go over. First off, uh, while I'm sure public-public uh, partnerships and interactions and relationships with external to the Census Bureau are, are not new, at least uh, given my tenure on the NAC and the ability to look at all of these as a novel approach, and it really leverages the expertise, resources, and funding. Um, this is also creating a heretofore inexistent data set, so this did not exist before, um, you know, the infrastructure uh, nor the methodology, and it's really filling what I perceive to be a void um, in the uh, ecosystem. It's enabling production of actual statistics that never before were possible. And I believe it's a potential resource benefit for the Census Bureau, particularly in operations, and uh, could increase its own ROI as this data set matures. Also interesting to note that this multi-stakeholder model and, and customer pull notion suggests that there'll be increasing relevance and real academic ability. As he mentioned, you know, the bulk of the research is going to be done by non-census uh, institutions and organizations, and to the extent they find this something that is interesting and, and worthy, we can only expect that this demand will increase. Next slide, please. I do want to take a moment and just try to dimensionalize what he's referred to as the transformational measurement. So on this slide, what we have are uh, special reports from the Bureau of Justice Statistics. They've done this at different intervals really looking to examine uh, one of the topics touched in the presentation, which is uh, parents in prison and their minor children. So I've highlighted the relevant statistics, but you can look at the blue square here. So in 2000, about 2.1% of U.S. resident population under age 18, i.e. children, had a parent that was incarcerated. In 2010, this rose to 2.3%, and in the latest report in 2021, Bureau of Justice did not share a percentage, but instead shared the raw number. And if you look at the detail there, you can see roughly they're about the same, uh, in the same ballpark. Uh, now, if we go to the next slide, what I've done is I've taken a couple of graphs that Keith just went through, and, and you can see here uh, percentages of children and just and involved covers and adults as well as that breakdown when we think of different population groups. Now here we're ranging uh, across different uh, events. So incarceration is just one. And we're also expanding the idea of not just parents or biological parents, but also co-resident adults. Uh, next slide, please. So far be it for me to uh, talk about not comparing apples and oranges, especially since the sense Bureau is charged with turning oranges into apples as part of its work 
really to make comparisons over time and, and space. But uh, neither of the graphs that I just shared are wrong. They're all correct. And really just want to highlight the difference. So Bureau of Justice Statistics took a snapshot at one point in time of a numerator and denominator of specifically defined variables and expressed that percentage. If you look at what's happened in C jars, instead of a snap point in time, we're looking at longitudinal. We've changed the variables, actually include and broaden the variable. So uh, really to compare the both, you know, I would challenge and actually encourage people to look at it more from a broader perspective. If we're talking about in the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you know, one in 40, one in 43, one in 48 children have a child in, involved in, in, in prison versus of anywhere upwards of 10, 20, or 40 percent of a children involved with a parent or a parental figure uh, involved in somewhere across the criminal justice ecosystem, it definitely lends to uh, a different color of the discussion and highlights the robustness that CJARS allows us to uh, bring to that topic. And I think it's very much in line with the director's comments at the beginning of our two-day meeting and talking about the, the evolving uh, role of the Census Bureau and uh, modernization efforts. Really, where are we going to go where the puck is in the future to allow uh, the critical discussions of this topic? Next slide, please. So it's not all roses and caviar. There's also some disadvantages and, and risks with this partnership and model. So one, when funding is fickle, so uh, periodic tin cupping every two to three years, whatever the term of the, uh, of the uh, grant is, it leads to uncertainty in terms of long-term sustainability. Uh, you know, it may be difficult to plan for the long-term, so that's something we need to keep in mind. Also, the majority of the work and the actual ownership is by an external non sense bureau partner, and that poses several risks. I won't be negative, but instead be positive and imagine what if there's a Powerball pool at the University of Michigan, and they win and never have to work another day in their life. You know, will we lose critical uh, knowledge uh, about the, uh, the process, especially around harmonization? Keith did a great job of showing just the immense scope and how this is such a non-standardized uh, ecosystem from states to municipalities. And this involves, you know, real legwork and relationship building in terms of getting the data, but then harmonizing it. Obviously, there's a necessary higher security threshold. There's bureaucracy. There's long timelines. Maybe unattractive to CJAR's employees or researchers or stakeholders who may want to work with this data set. And this subject matter is intrinsically sensitive. There's a lot of privacy concerns and restrictions, and these could be roadblocks to further development of the data infrastructure and consequently their usable statistics. I'll also point out that relation building, data agreements with all of these jurisdictional entities is a challenge, and is it really the best use of Census Bureau of UN or University of Michigan staff and researchers? Next slide, please. I will preface this by saying in no means do I expect nor is it feasible to have responses to all of these what may appear to be a laundry list of questions and areas to explore, uh, more to just thought, uh, thought, thought thoughters and, and engage in discussion. So I'm wondering, you know, is there a potential use case for CJARs to actually supplement or even substitute the existing Census Bureau operations? So, so for example, group quarter enumeration in the 2030 decennial, is that a possibility? Now, given the nature of the private and sensitive nature of the subject matter, are there safeguards in place that ensure that any statistics by the Census Bureau or third-party researchers will be neutral and objective as opposed to something that's politicized that could stick into the highs and already marginalized population? Uh, is there a potential for CRUs to be used by other federal agencies or linked with other federal agency records? I'm curious to understand what are the current resource constraints and more importantly, what additional resources will be required to expand the coverage and ensure long-term viability of this data product. Next slide, please. Are sufficient steps being taken to codify and record harmonization methodology, really with an eye towards preserving institutional knowledge? 
And then how would the team characterize the major barriers to further deposition? Is it just simply a matter of legwork? Is it relationship building? Is it, are there any mistrust of, of the census of the project that people are encountering? Uh, existence of, say, privacy laws? Now, several items are out of scope currently on this project. For example, juvenile records. Does that handicap at all the full potential of CJARS? And it would be interesting to see if there's a use case for CJARS to contribute or provide some additional context to the ongoing discussion that we have in this country around prison gerrymandering. Next slide, please. So, as a fellow alum and a proud Wolverine, I know I'm not the only one in the room, I beg your indulgence to allow me to finalize this presentation with an understated but no less enthusiastic Go Blue. Thank you. Um, since we're running behind, could, could you all give me advice on, this is a lot of questions, whether I should try to respond to them right now or in writing or open questions for the floor? We, we have three questions from um, advisory members that we can discuss at this time. And the questions that, John, that were in your, um, in your, your response just now, could you email those? on you. Yes, I'd be happy to do that. Okay. So our first question is, is from Florentia. Do you have the floor? I think you answered my question in one of your footnotes, um, but I was wondering if you link data from the juvenile justice system or if the focus is just on the adult criminal justice system. And do you right have now the to expand oh. or not? Sorry. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a great question, and, and it was, sorry, I skipped over that part on the slide. Um, right now, the focus is on the adult uh, uh, criminal justice system. Um, we're not opposed to working on that. It's just that um, we, uh, at the very beginning, we, we thought that the, the barrier in terms of data privacy would be higher for, um, for collecting juvenile justice data. And with basically, we have a small team at the University of Michigan and with the limited resources that we have, we're, we have trade-offs in terms of geographic scope and the, and the uh, uh, criminal justice processes that we'll cover. And so we decided to exclude that. So it just, if we had the resources to expand the scope of the project, it would, it would definitely come, uh, you know, fall within topics that we're interested in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will give Richard Chang the floor. For your question, Richard? Yes, hi, this is Richard Chang, MAC member. There were several slides that presented race categories that utilize the Asian Pacific Islander category. Uh, my questions are what prevented the disaggregation of that category and is it possible to exclude Pacific Islanders from that category? And I'm asking because it's extremely problematic since there have been numerous studies showing that Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are disproportionately represented in pretrial detention, incarceration rates, and parole revocations. And the API category has the potential to mislead policymakers and reason community efforts to address discriminatory treatment in the justice system. Thank you. Uh, that's a really useful question. We we have not disaggregated before. Uh, most of these um, uh, statistics are from working papers where there's some limitation on the the amount of space that we had to to, to communicate results. But I think that's something that that we should that we should look at. Um, and, and certainly with the administrative rec records, we're, we're able to uh, disaggregate those categories. So, uh, thank you very much. We'll, we will definitely take a look at it. And real quick, I see, Elma, that you have presented uh, three in. Could you, could you think you can get those in real quick? Yes, if you don't mind, yes. Thank you. Um, again, thank you for your presentation. So I'll just, I'll just say a couple of things, and you can feel free to read my comments as well. So obviously kudos on the work. And my few things I'll just flag is that I do hope that some of this information is, is, is not presented in a way that continues to perpetuate that, you know, certain groups of people are criminals. And so I think it's just, I think it's tended to potentially how this information is being disseminated. Um, and, and I think uh, my other sort of big point I want to flag is also 
if there's attention to helping people understand why some of the disparities may exist, right, so that there's more intentionality about the mechanisms that may be leading to the disparities. Um, and then my last one I will flag is uh, you had mentioned that you all um, are potentially working with other researchers, but also wondering if, if other community members and or advocates uh, know about you all in case they have questions that they think your data can help them with, because I do think there's an important value in the kind of information you could provide to those who may focus on uh, general quarters and even undercount issues um, as well. But again, I, I appreciate your attention to sort of the intersectionality of gender, race, ethnicity, and age, and, and other things. Um, thank you. I, yeah, I, on the just presenting the information, we're, we're, I'm always sensitive to that, and we try to be really sensitive with the language we use about about this population. Um, in terms of kind of pathways, I think looking at, at particular policies, and I, that there's definitely a role there, uh, especially for researchers that would access the data through the uh, FSRDCs. Um, uh, community members, we, at the University of Michigan on the product, there's a board of directors, and we're interested in getting um, more representation on that board of directors from uh, uh, people who might have been justice involved or work as advocates. Um, and. And absolutely, about the, you know, this, this population survey coverage, I'm very interested in those topics, but we haven't had a chance to do research on them yet. Thank you. And I forgot to, to thank John. Thank I really you. appreciate his, his engagement this week on the project. And before I just turn it back over to Director Santos, do you have any comments at this time? Okay, thank you so much. Karen, I will turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you very much, John. Thank you, Keith. Uh, thank you for that very, very interesting presentation and discussion. Um, well, now we are ready to pause for a 10-minute break. Uh, and after the break, we will actually suspend the meeting until 4.15 for the presentation of the 2022 Max Spring Virtual Meeting Recommendations. While the meeting is suspended, the phone lines will remain open and MAC members will congregate amongst themselves offline to discuss and formulate recommendations. Thank you. Welcome back from break. We apologize for the delay. As a reminder, today's call is recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect. And it's my pleasure to turn the call back to Karen Battle. You may now begin, ma'am. Thank you very much. Welcome back, everyone, to the 2022 MAC Spring Virtual Meeting. And again, we apologize for the delay. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, we just had a few technical difficulties to iron out. Uh, just as a reminder, I want you guys to know that information for closed captioning services can be found on the MAC website. Um, and now I will turn things over to James Tucker, who will present the 2022 NAC Spring Virtual Meeting Recommendation. Thanks so much, Karen. And I'm, I'm just going to note two things as we go through these. First of all, NAC members, please mute, um, except when I ask you to unmute to vote on each of these. And then in addition, a few of the recommendations are rather lengthy. I'm going to summarize those that are particularly lengthy so that we can actually get through these and then 30 minutes or so. Uh, so with that, recommendation one. Uh, we'll be doing these votes on groups of five. Um, recommendation one. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau begin planning for an in-person meeting of the NAC in the D.C. metro area for its fall 2022 meeting that is to be consistent with any CDC guidelines that may then be in effect for in-person events and to make plans for a hybrid option for any members unable to travel. Recommendation 2A. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau reschedule the fall 2022 NAC meeting to Thursday, October 27, 2022, and Friday, October 28, 2022. Recommendation 2B. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau schedule a non-public half-day workshop on Wednesday, October 26, 2022, between leadership of the NAC and the Census Bureau's Advisory Committee branch to facilitate the transition to the incoming chair and vice chair of the NAC. Recommendation 3. The NAC recommends the Census Bureau charter a 2030 Census Advisory Committee 
with an emphasis on recruiting members from external stakeholder groups who represent or work with historically undercounted populations. Recommendation four. The NAC recommends the Census Bureau Charter a NAC working group to examine the extent to which the Bureau has implemented diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, or DEIA, principles to its recruitment and employment practices. The working group should be chartered through 2024, provide deliverables at future NAC meetings, and produce a final written report and recommendations. Recommendation five, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau redouble its efforts to build and strengthen partnerships, um, and essentially that um, it would also consider cost effectiveness and feasibility of dedicating census staff time for external contract or collaborative work using confidential or proprietary census products. Uh, with that, I'll ask the NAC members to unmute and all in favor of adopting recommendations one through five, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay, any opposed, say nay. Well, I was going to oppose just one of them, but I guess we don't have that option. No, you do, um, please. And, and please identify yourself and indicate which one you would like to oppose. So uh, this is Brad Cole. I'm an I for everything except 2A and 2B. Okay. And then, um, no, thank you. And any abstentions? Not hearing any. Recommendations one through five are adopted with the um, uh, notation that um, NAC member Cole has voted against 2A and 2B. Okay, recommendation six. The NAC recommends the Census Bureau ensure that their DEIA principles are represented within longstanding and new partners and examine other ways to bring diverse voices and, experience, and expertise, such as through institutions who have the talent and expertise to support the Bureau's work. Uh, recommendation 7A, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau ensure that each directorate area of the census is sufficiently diverse at all levels. Recommendation 7B, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau examine other ways of examining the diversity of their workforce starting as early as possible, such as supporting the training of undergraduate and graduate students, um, especially at some of the examples that are noted. Recommendation 7C, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau examine whether the Bureau's policies, procedures, and practices in recruiting and retaining a diverse workforce across diverse locations are impacted by workers' location and access to broadband, which may be a particular challenge for those living in remote locations and tribal lands. Recommendation 8A, the NAC recommends that in all the Census Bureau's activities to transform and modernize its activities, the Bureau must be guided by a guiding principle of obtaining a complete and accurate count of historically undercounted populations. Um, and this is referred to as guiding principle in the subsequent recommendations. 8B, the NAC recommends that consistent with the guiding principle, the Census Bureau identify ways in which effective data gathering activities or historically underpended populations may differ from those used for most households. Recommendation 8C, the NAC recommends that consistent with the guiding principle, the Census Bureau undertake comprehensive evaluations of each historically undercounted population group to include field tests in collaboration with partners from each of those groups to identify ways in which outreach and data gathering must differ for those groups to be effective in obtaining a complete and accurate count for each of those groups. The NAC further recommends that the evaluations be completed and publicly, publicly reported in written form by December 31st, 2023. Recommendation 8D, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau propose appropriations for its operations that are sufficient to have the resources to achieve the guiding principle noted above. Recommendation 9, the NAC recommends that in light of the focus on DEIA in the modernization of the Census Bureau, that the Census Bureau utilize equity in all facets of the Bureau's data collection and dissemination operations, including the racial and ethnic categories. Recommendation 10A. Um, I'm gonna streamline this a little bit. The NAC recommends that Director Santos and other census staff responsible for decision-making attend the mid-year conference at the National Congress of American Indians uh, for purposes of understanding the barriers that American Indians and Alaska Natives face and completing all census surveys and to mutually discuss solutions. Recommendation 10B, 
It Act recommends that the Census Bureau collaborate with NCAI and tribal governments to arrange in-person visits and listening sessions by census decision makers and remote and or linguistically isolated American Indian populations in American Indian tribal areas outside of Alaska with, with such visits to be coordinated with the assistance of NCAI and the tribal governments to be visited. Recommendation 10C. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau collaborate with partners from other historically undercounted population groups to arrange in-person visits and listening sessions by census decision makers in those areas where those populations are located. Recommendation 10D. The NAC recommends that in arranging in-person visits and listening sessions that the Census Bureau collaborate with partners to identify regions and communities that experience undercounts of young children equal to or greater than the national undercount of young children. And with that, I'm going to ask the NAC members to unmute themselves. Um, all in favor of adopting recommendations 6 through 10, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. Um, and any abstentions, please so indicate. Okay, NAC recommendations 6 through 10 are adopted. Recommendation, um, please mute yourself. Uh, recommendation 11A, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau convene consultations to identify those areas in historically undercounted population groups for whom an early start to decennial operations would improve the count. Um, and then it gives examples of such places. Recommendation 11B, the NAC recommends that as part of its planning for the 2030 decennial census, the Census Bureau implement new early starts to its field operations for those areas in which the Bureau determines in collaboration with historically undercounted populations that an early start would improve the count. Recommendation 12, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau establish a specialist program similar to the Tribal Relations Specialist Program for each of the other historically undercounted population groups and other emerging communities of color. Recommendation 13A. The NAC recommends that in addition to the existing tribal consultations, regular consultations occur in collaboration with other national, state, and local organizations representing historically undercounted populations and communities of color. Recommendation 13B. The NAC recommends that in conducting consultations with tribal governments and with other historically undercounted populations, the focus should be on working with stakeholders, community NGOs, and other civic leaders to identify barriers to completing census surveys and how to overcome them. Recommendation 14, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau collaborate with national partners to develop a translation program overseen by those partners through Commerce Department grants to the partners to cover languages and dialects not provided by the Bureau as part of its regular communications, outreach, and survey operations. And then recommendation 15A, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau commit to sending its mail communications to every household in the United States, regardless of whether or not the household has a traditional address. Recommendation 15B, it's a little long, but I will read the whole thing. The NAC recommends the Census Bureau work with the U.S. Postal Service, tribal governments, and state and local officials to develop residential street addresses for households receiving mail through non-traditional addresses, such as post office boxes, roll route addresses, and addresses identified by geography or physical location by providing dedicated technical assistance through subject matter experts and developing a Census Bureau grant program to build the capacity and infrastructure for geomapping and residential addressing that includes involvement of historically undercounted communities. This time I'll ask the NAP members to unmute themselves. All in favor of uh, recommendations 11 through 15, please so indicate by saying aye. Hi. Any opposed, please say nay. Any abstentions, please so indicate. Okay, with that, recommendations 11 through 15 are adopted. Recommendation 16. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau's Office of Strategic Alliances, as part of its outreach to businesses, develop partnerships with telecommunications companies and ISPs to offer broadband service through free mobile hotspots during census operations, decennial ACS and other surveys. Recommendation 17, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau improve and increase communication and collaboration 
between the Bureau and historically undercounted population groups, particularly those that were undercounted in 2020. The newly formed Office of Strategic Alliances can be instrumental in this effort. Recommendation 18. The NAC recommends the Census Bureau update the NAC on up mandate and activities across directorate team on undercount of young children on a regular basis to include, and then it lists under that five specific activities. Recommendation 19. The NAC recommends evaluating the statistical and substantive implications of the Disclosure Avoidance System, or DAS, when evaluating dictatal changes between censuses for items included in the person and unit files. This involves comparing 2020 data with earlier censuses, both with and without DAS, at multiple levels of geography and for different racial and ethnic groups. And then finally, recommendation 20A, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau evaluate and report on the accuracy of the count of all historically undercounted populations, including young children below the county level. Recommendation 20B, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau evaluate and report on the impact of differential privacy on historically undercounted populations. Recommendation 20C, the NAC recommends that for each DHC data set for children, the Census Bureau add a disclaimer explaining that the data set did not preserve the relationship between the adults and children in the household. And recommendation 20D, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau's disclaimer directed the user to a data set in the DDHC where the adult and child relationship is preserved or indicate if that data was unavailable. At this time, I'm gonna ask the NAC members to unmute themselves. All in favor of recommendations 16 through 20, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any, opposed, any opposed, please say nay. And any abstentions, please so indicate. Okay, with that, recommendations 16 through 20 are adopted. Going to 21A, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau make available in the plan 2020 DHC release as much of the AIAN data for two or more races as possible. 21B, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau make available in the plan 2020 DHC release as much of the AIAN data at the block level as possible, tracking what was released at the block level in the 2010 DHC release. Recommendation 22, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau increase the privacy loss budget allocated for tribal areas to reduce the error rate for less popular census geographies, such as at the block or place level. Recommendation 23A, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau continue to schedule tribal consultations to obtain feedback on 2020 census data and products and the impact of differential privacy on those products. Recommendation 23B, the NAC recommends that in preparing for future tribal consultations, the Census Bureau implement the recommendations made by the NAC at the March 2022 special meeting to make the Census Bureau's communications and consultations with tribal leaders more effective. Recommendation 23C, I won't read the entirety of it, um, but it says the NAC recommends that in devising more effective ways to conduct tribal consultations with American Indian and Alaska Native governments on differential privacy and related topics, that the Census Bureau collaborate with Adam Geisler at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration with additional information listed. Okay, recommendation 24, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau find solutions to produce DDHC data at the lowest level before moving to the next geography level, e.g. exhaust solutions for block level, then block group, and then tracked. At a minimum, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau produce DDHC data at the census tract level. Recommendation 25A, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau make the timeline for release of DDHC data a high priority and expedite it as much as possible, consistent with existing commitments by the Census Bureau to obtain feedback from tribal consultations, as well as consultations with other stakeholders and data users for identification of priority uses of that data. Recommendation 25B, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau consider a two-tiered release of DDHC Dash A data, including a faster release for populations at higher levels of geography, such as state and or geographies, such as more populous counties with a low margin of error and low risk of privacy disclosures, followed by a subsequent release of DDHC-A tables, 
for the remaining levels of geography. This time, I'll ask NAC members to unmute themselves. All in favor of recommendations 21 through 25, please, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. And any abstentions, please so indicate. And with that, NAC recommendations 21 through 25 are adopted. Recommendation 26, the NAC recommends that DHC-A data be released for counties and all other geographies at the same thresholds as the ACS five-year file. Recommendation 27A, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau accurately describe the tables for children living with unmarried relatives to explain that that, that child may, might be living with one parent or two, or in the case of a child living with an unrelated householder, that the child might be living with a parent who is not the householder. Recommendation 27B, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau refer data users to other census data products that do not report on the relationship of children to both adults, such as the National Survey of Children's Health. The report should identify the relationship and include information of partner or un, of an unmarried parent of any children living in the household. And it gives table F0901, for example. Recommendation 28, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau be more transparent to the public and through its stakeholder communications about the Census Bureau's decision-making on the trade-offs applying differential privacy to the DHC and DDHC data sets involving level of geography and level of disaggregation. Recommendation 29, the NAC recommends that to facilitate tribal and stakeholder input on its releases of the demonstration data sets, the Census Bureau offer a more user-friendly summary of the comprehensive information in the crosswalk, such as through the proposal by census subject matter experts to organize the tables in the crosswalk by categories or data characteristics. And then finally, recommendation 30, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau accurately describe children's relationships with other household, other adults in the household as follows, and then give several examples. With that, I'm going to ask the Census NAC members to unmute themselves. All in favor of recommendations 26 through 30, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. And any abstentions, please so indicate. Okay, with that, NAC recommendations 26 through 30 are adopted. Recommendation 31. The NAC recommends the Census Bureau collaborate with the OMB to move the process forward to reconvene the working group to resume modernizing the outdated 1997 OMB race ethnicity factors. Recommendation 32. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau, in collaboration with the OMB and the working group, issue a written public report on the research, testing, public comments, and preliminary findings and recommendations made by the working group prior to December 31st, 2016 to modernize the 1997 OMB race and ethnicity standards. The NAC further recommends the report be issued by April 30th, 2023. Recommendation 33. The NAC recommends the Census Bureau hire subject matter experts in the MENA and SOGI populations to assist in the research, testing, and outreach to OMB, the working group, and their affected stakeholders. Recommendation 34. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau evaluate and report on why response rates in Black and Hispanic tracts dropped and why there was an increase in White and Asian response rates. Recommendation 34B. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau report overcounts and undercounts in the 2020 Census by Asian subethnic populations, Black and or non-White Hispanic populations, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander subethnic populations, and those ethnic populations from Middle Eastern, North African, or MENA regions. Recommendation 34C, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau release sub-state data that allows stakeholders to research variations in coverage area by race and ethnicity. Uh, and then it goes on to explain what that would be. Recommendation 35, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau examine the item non-response for all for other racial groups on the race question as the Bureau is doing with the Hispanic groups on the ethnicity question across various modes, e.g. internet, paper, phone, and proxy. The NAC further recommends that the Census Bureau analyze and report on the impact of a combined question on the race question for other racial populations beyond the Hispanic population, including those who may, be, who may check off Black and Hispanic or Hispanic and another race, giving several examples. 
And with that, I'm going to ask the NAC members to unmute themselves. All of the uh, recommendations one through 35, please indicate that that's high. Hi. 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 Any of please say nay. And any abstentions, please so indicate. Okay, with that, NAC recommendations 31 through 35 are adopted. Recommendation 36A. The NAC recommends Census Bureau through its participation in the working group, continue its work with stakeholders in the Latino community in exploring an alternative to separate questions on Hispanic origin and race, such as one combined question on race and ethnicity, taking into consideration the impact the combined question has on the response rates of other racial and ethnic groups. 36B. The DAC recommends that the Census Bureau, through its participation in the working group, include in its analysis of the combined question the inclusion of Latinos as one of the categories, accompanied by detailed checkboxes for Latino national origin and subgroups. Recommendation 37. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau, through its participation in the working group, propose guidelines that ensure that the collection of data on, on Latinos allows for Latinos to indicate more than one national origin or subgroup. Recommendation 38, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau, through its participation in the working group, conduct and publicly report research on the impacts of various options for formatting the race and ethnicity question have on the number of those identifying as American Indian or Alaska Native alone. Recommendation 39, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau publish a federal register notice soliciting feedback from tribal nations and stakeholders on the format for respondents to identify the tribe or tribes with which they are associated or enrolled, including the examples of tribes listed on the questionnaire, clarity of instructions that respondents may identify multiple tribes, and the impact that the number of available boxes for identification of tribe or tribes has on the completion of the identification question. Recommendation 40, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau conduct tribal consultations on all proposals to update the 1997 OMB race and ethnicity standards to include communication of research the Bureau has conducted in response to recommendation number 36. And with that, I'm going to ask the NAC members to unmute themselves. All in favor of NAC recommendations 30, 36 through 40, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those, please say nay. And any abstentions, please so indicate. With that, NAC recommendations 36 through 40 are adopted. You may mute yourselves again briefly. Recommendation 41A, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau, through its participation in the working group, propose specific guidelines for the collection of detailed Asian race and ethnicity data that adopt the 2015 National Content Test, or MCT, recommended format, which includes several separate checkboxes and then listing the, the specific ethnic groups. Recommendation 41B, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau, through its participation in the working group, propose specific guidelines for the collection of detailed Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islanders race and ethnicity data that adopt the 2015 MCT recommended format, which includes a separate checkboxes and then listing the examples of the ethnicities. Recommendation 42, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau, um, through its participation in the working group, proposed removal of the other from the category Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. Recommendation 43, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau, through its participation in the working group, propose guidelines specifying that the race and ethnicity standards are the minimum categories and that federal agencies can and should continue to go beyond the guidelines in their data collection and propose protocols on how to tabulate responses written into text boxes and how and when to report a roll-up of racial and ethnic subgroups if the data are not adequate to report more detailed information. Recommendation 44. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau, through its participation in the working group, propose adding a separate ethnic reporting category as part of a combined question on race and ethnicity for persons with origins in the Middle Eastern and North African or MENA region. And finally, recommendation 45, the NAC recommends that to ensure accurate self-identification, the Census Bureau, through its participation in the working group, proposes the media category be an ethnic one. At this time, I'm going to ask NAC members to unmute themselves. All in favor of recommendations 41 through 45, please indicate by saying aye. 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 
Any opposed, please say nay. And any abstentions, please so indicate. Okay, with that, recommendations 41 through 45 are adopted. You may yourselves again separately. Uh, recommendation 46. NAC recommends that the Census Bureau, through its participation in the working group, propose adoption of a comprehensive geographical definition of the MENA category that includes persons with origin from the League of Arab States, and then listing those states, and transnational communities, and then listing those. Recommendation 47. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau, through its participation in the working group, propose guidelines for the collection of detailed MENA ethnicity data that treats the MENA region as one diverse geographical area and that subboxes be assigned to the largest groups by population in the U.S., giving examples, while also using examples that include a transnational group, giving examples, a Gulf population, with examples, and an Arab-speaking country in sub-Saharan Africa, giving examples. Recommendation 48, the NAC applauds the Census Bureau for its support of the MENA category. The NAC recommends that if the MENA is moved forward as an ethnicity category by OMB and the working group, that the Census Bureau examine and report on the impact of this ethnic group on racial groups, especially the selection of the black or African American category, in light of the long and sordid anti-black racism in the U.S. coupled with recent African immigrants from the MENA region who are likely to identify with their cultural group than the black or African American racial group and potentially other groups. Recommendation 49, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau through its participation in the working group ensure that the collection of data on the black population allows for black immigrant populations to indicate more than one national origin or subgroup. And then finally, recommendation 50, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau through its participation in the working group ensure that diverse black African-American populations from the African diaspora have equal opportunities via check boxes and examples to self-identify. With that, I'm going to ask the NAC members to unmute themselves. Uh, all in favor of recommendations 46 through 50, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. And any abstentions, please so indicate. Okay, with that, NAC recommendations 46 through 50 are adopted. Uh, please meet yourselves again temporarily. Recommendation 51. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau be transparent about the impacts of using a blended base with corrections for the undercount of younger age groups and the impact on results of older populations by race and ethnicity. Recommendation 52. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau be transparent about the impacts of using a blended base on racial and ethnic groups that experience substantial changes in the population counts between the 2010 and 2020 censuses. Recommendation 53. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau find ways to improve upon population estimates using the blended base, taking into account the results of the PES and addressing and factoring into those population estimates the systemic undercount and historically undercounted populations. Recommendation 54. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau continue to make decisions on how to prepare the population estimates year by year until it has had a chance to research the impact of the blended base on historically undercounted populations, particularly communities of color. And then finally, recommendation 55, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau identify ways to identify the underrepresentation of historically undercounted populations in the administrative records used by the Bureau for its population estimates. This time, I'll ask NAC members to unmute themselves. All in favor of recommendations 51 through 55, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. And any abstentions, please so indicate. With that, uh, NAC recommendations 51 through 55 are adopted. Please temporarily meet yourselves. Recommendation 56, we're in the final stretch. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau improve its communications with the public about its uh, administrative record program by, one, better education of tribal governments, NGOs, and other non-federal sources of how ARs are used and protected from disclosure outside of the Census Bureau. Two, resolution of concerns of tribal governments about data sovereignty. Three, improving the process of negotiating, reviewing, and implementing memoranda of understanding, or MOUs. And four, providing more user-friendly technical assistance in the process 
and means by which ARs are produced by the Census Bureau, are produced to the Census Bureau. Recommendation 57A, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau not use administrative records as a substitute for the Bureau improving its efforts to obtain 100% response rates from historically undercounted populations. Recommendation 57B, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau not use administrative records as a shortcut to close out non-response follow-up cases in which fewer than four attempts are made. Recommendation 58, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau increase its transparency by publishing detailed data describing the use of administrative records in decennial, ACS, and other annual and periodic surveys. Those descriptions should identify the type of AR, source and ages of the ARs, and their limitations. Population counted by use of ARs should be broken down by race, ethnic subgroups, age, young children, and housing tendency. Recommendation 59. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau report by race and ethnicity on the use of administrative records in the 2020 Census among historically undercounted populations, including data on undercounts of young children. And then finally, recommendation 61 or 60. Um, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau research and report on the accuracy of the household rosters in households counted using administrative data compared to households that responded on their own and households counted during non-response follow-up by enumerators. When the Bureau undertakes this research, it should consider uh, the differing definition of households for different sets of administrative records and then gives an example. Okay, at this point, I'll ask the NAC members to unmute themselves, all in favor of recommendations 50. 60, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any of, please say nay. And any abstentions, please so indicate. Okay, with that, NAC recommendations 56 through 60 are adopted. Please put yourself one last time. And then um, we will go through, let me just see, it looks like we have eight more. So we will do the last eight as a group. Um, recommendation 61, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau improve knowledge capture in the CJARS project or Criminal Justice Administrative Records project, including through additional resources for the project. Recommendation 62, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau prioritize the use case of supplementing current um, group quarters operations for the CJARS project and work towards the end goal of a tested and validated alternative method of group quarter enumeration for the 2030 decennial census. Recommendation 63, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau seek funding for, CJARS, for the CJARS project via the annual budget appropriation process with the aim to reach a Census Bureau funding share of at least 25% of total project funding across all sources. Recommendation 64, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau inform the NAC about dates to CJARS statistics report and data products, and other program updates, particularly regarding language and context setting for historically underfounded populations. Recommendation 65, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau procure additional resources from within the Census Bureau, specifically to facilitate establishing relations, relationships with new criminal justice, jurisdictional entities, and enter into data sharing agreements to expand the coverage of the CJARS project. Recommendation 66, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau ensure that the 2021 one-year and five-year ACS estimates incorporate the 2020 population based on detailed origin. Recommendation 67, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau provide more effective public messaging and outreach to explain the conditions under which community organizations and public agencies can use ACS data to get the most current and accurate numbers for detailed origin groups. And then finally, last but not least, Recommendation 68, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau consider adding summary tables to the Population and Housing Characteristics, or PHC, files, specifically by those that link two or more members of the same household, uh, examples being spouses, siblings, or other family members, family or non-family members. With that, I'm going to ask the NAC members to unmute themselves one last time. All in favor of NAC recommendation 61 through 68, please unmute. Aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. And any abstentions, please so indicate. Okay, with that, NAC recommendations 61 through 68 are adopted. And I want to thank all of the NAC members for 
of their diligence over this week to put those together. We went through literally 19 pages of recommendations in about 35 minutes. Uh, so thank you so much for your work and um, your endeavors. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Karen. Thank you very much, James, and thank you, NAC members. Well, this concludes the 2022 NAC Spring Virtual Meeting Proceeding for day two. Uh, thanks again to each committee member and to all of our participants for such an engaging meeting. Your comments and perspectives are really vital to all of our efforts. Uh, before adjourning, uh, I would like to thank you all for your participation. Um, I also want to thank the members of the Advisory Committee Branch for their work in organizing this meeting and all of the supporting census offices that made this meeting so successful. Uh, please note that the uh, next National Advisory Committee meeting is currently scheduled for November 3 and 4, 2022. And with that, uh, this concludes the MAC 2022 Spring Virtual Meeting. Uh, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Good evening. Thanks. That concludes today's call. All participants may disconnect at this time. Thank you for joining.